And it is exactly that hammer that every single team remaining here at Six Invitational are looking to lift at the end of this week on Championship Sunday. But before we get there, we still have our playoffs to go through. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to wonderful, beautiful Sao Paulo and to our playoffs show here live in our studio. And we are ready to go. I'm Elsa Medic, your host. I guess me and Ian will be going through this as the week continues. Very excited to be here and have fun with all of you. And with me on the desk, our fresh and friend, Fresh and Fabian. If you call me fresh and friend one more time, I'm a three-time <laughs> invitational winner. He's a one-time EUL relegation coach. Who? I think that it's Fabian and... But do you know what combined? We are three-time invitational winners and one-time relegated, so that's absolutely fine. <laughs> that's we are thing. so unbelievably back. Always look on the bright side of life, is what they say. Let's talk about today. First, our broadcast schedule. As everybody will see, we have a lot of games to go through today. But of course, throughout the next few days, if those of you that have been watching over the past uh, well, week, pretty much, you've seen 20 teams be reduced down to 16 from our four groups down to our playoffs brackets. And we're going to talk about that to lead us into our six final teams later on this week. So here is our schedule. Stream A and B will be running simultaneously today and tomorrow. Tomorrow, so you can watch the Stream B matches on Twitch.tv for slash Rainbow Six Bravo, all found on there. Stream A will two, well, for both teams actually, for both streams, the first two games, best of threes, will feed into the last two matches of the day. W7M, Wolves, Dark Zero, and Team Liquid. You can find that here on stream all day. FaZe and Lost, Fury and NIP will be playing on B stream simultaneously, and then waiting for the winner to play G2 later on. Today. Here's our bracket. You'll see, well, eight teams that are fighting that we're probably going to be focusing more on today. However, Sonics, G2, Space Station, and Virtus Pro are waiting for the winners of said matches. They are top seeded in their groups, and that's why they have a one game advantage. However, Jack, yes. there's some teams in our lower bracket that have one more life to go. And I think there's a few surprising teams, you know, notably, to be honest, VRX, maybe Bliss, Falcons. Actually, all the lower bracket teams, yeah. you could have argued, went out. They've kind of made their upsets, they've got their way through the groups. Big thing for the lower bracket teams, they do not play today because all of the other teams remaining in the competition, the 12 teams in the upper bracket play today as well, they're going to find practice very hard. So I do have a little bit of concern coming into tomorrow is how, how they will perform with that one day's rest. I actually think it's kind of a good thing to be in the lower bracket though, because now you have your backs against the wall. You he don't... won it from there. Like, yeah, he that did. I, that's what I was going to get to as well. We won it from there last year with G2, but you never have a second chance. But also the teams that go up against you, they've actually lost the game. So maybe their confidence is a little bit shaken, you know, because they go up against you and you're in a nice position. You know where you're at. You've decided here's where we're going to be. And that's where you go from. But you both said it. These are kind of surprising teams to find in there, especially considering the level of competition here at SI. Are you surprised, Fabian, by seeing these four teams in the playoffs? I think the groups more or less played out pretty much the way we expected them to. There are a little bit of surprises. Like my biggest one is M80 not making it out of group. That is a bit of a surprise to me. But other than that, I think they played out quite reasonably to what expectations were. Actually, let's look back from the macro side of things because a lot of games have transpired, a lot of best of threes, which gives us a lot of data to work through. And an obviously defender-sided meta, Jack. Yeah, it's the big overarching storyline of this whole event is it is the most defender-sided six invitational we have ever seen. Now, on the screen, you will see the maps and look at some of those maps bordering on a 70% defense win rate. That means teams are going to be coming in with like a 2-4 split on, you know, pretty pretty normal maps for Oregon Club, pretty standard maps, and being happy with that because of the way that the defense is playing out. And I think that's the one thing that we are seeing. Defense currently in this tournament is absolutely king. It's absolutely king. And we're looking at the maps, as Jack said, but why is the reason why is what we're trying to get to today. And we're going to tell you why. Because if we go over to the defender-sided operators, we're going to be seeing a lot and a lot of the same operators being played. And obviously, Asami and Fenrir are going to be the ones that I would say have the absolute biggest impact here. So you look at the operators, Fenrir, we know, can basically put up traps everywhere. Has barbed wires on top of that. And those Yetis, they're hard to find. They're small. They're not that easy to spot unless you basically drive your drone to a door or a window, turn that drone around, which you kind of don't want to do because that means everything in front of you, you're missing out on. Where's Tuberau? Well, Tuberau is an interesting point, actually. So Tuberau not on this presence. You know, he's just a bit low. I think he's 748 most in terms of presence. However, the impact that Tuberau's had, <laughs> Even though he is strong, he's very loud in here. 
This is the best part about an invitation. I love it. The impact that Two Brow has had in terms of the bans. When a team bans Two Brow inside of a map, they then leave open another power operator in that list. That means that there will be a Solace, a Zami, Fenrir, Cade, Mira, at least Valkyrie. That's, you know, seven operators that will be available if Two Brow is banned. So not just him coming in and being strong, the fact that he's, you know, getting bans against him allows the defenders to be stronger because of the other operators available. There's just so many power operators. That's it. There's Absolutely. so many power operators. How do you deal with those defenders though? I'm, yeah. I'm looking really... That's the problem, right? We don't have that many solutions. We do, however, have an idea that at least me and Jack thought of. The way that we think that you can counter this is by picking the attack operators that kind of play into it. Oh, wow. We have Ash, Thoris, Twitch, Brava, and Sophia. And all of them can more or less take care of Gaddis in their own way. Mm -hmm. What we're maybe waiting for a little bit is probably to go back to the old coastline of the good and good old days. You know, you didn't even play a hard breacher back then. Maybe we'll see more of these operators being played just because they are able to blow up all the traps and take care of it. And that's the common theme is between these operators, they either have drones that are available to get rid of utility or they have explosives that are available to get rid of utility. And in Flora's case, it's absolutely both. Yeah, and we have one more thing that I don't think that most people maybe have looked deep into, the nade change. Because we've seen the nade change where you can't cook the grenades anymore, we're not seeing them being played. We have been seeing 12 flashbangs in a round absolutely. and stuff like that, which have led to less Jaeger play and less one my play, which means more space for the power operators to creep themselves in. So there's a big entire conspiracy against, it's an against flow, the attackers. Right? Yeah. In Atlanta, I actually think we saw over three nades on average brought by attack on, on, on each attack, they would bring on average three nades. They're now bringing far less, and I think we've only seen maybe one, maybe two actual clean grenade kills that have happened in the entire tournament, By and mistake. that was over a thousand rounds. So it's like the nade change has affected attack so much, maybe beyond what was expected. Yeah, it feels like at least one of those two kills was by complete accident. And then the other times a grenade was used was to deal with castle barricades, which is very different than what we used to imagine grenades would be used for. But you see the team on the camera in front of you. We are going to talk about the squad. Wolves is up first on the chopping block before we start our match here with Wolves versus W7M. We have stats on the line. Jack, please, can you help peruse through them? Yeah, and I think some of these stats for Wolves are good. I think, you know, the expectation on Wolves and the sentiment on Wolves coming into this tournament was actually reasonably low. And I think they actually surprised us coming through the groups. They had a real shot at getting in that first place. Obviously, it didn't quite transpire. They did end up getting in the third place kind of bucket. But they had a shot at first place. They had a big upset against SSG, I would say. And I would call it an upset based on recent performances. Um, so sentiment on Wolves is that actually they're on a good run of momentum. And talking about recent performances, I could not keep myself away from this. <laughs> Me and Jack actually played them in a tier three tournament right. about, what, three weeks ago? <laughs> yes. And it was the reason weeks. why this builds in back into the surprise factor of this is they struggled to play against me and Jack. And we were sitting and playing consulate and it felt like they didn't know how to clear me out. I play about 100 hours of ranked each year these days. So it's not like I have the most mechanical talent anymore. So it was a surprise that they couldn't really clear us out. How would they go up against SI opponents? And they've actually managed to turn that around a lot. Looking at their individual performance, they're doing a lot better, both as individuals, which then leads into better team play, which with better team play, it leads into better individual performance. So it's just a positive circle of never-ending goodness. Well, that, that seems like it was, it was the problem in the past and continues to be, which is group stage, we're doing well, we get to the big games and we start to falter. Do you think that could change here, Jack? Um, yeah, I mean, I've got a lot of beliefs in Wolves. You know, I'm European, I'm a bit of a European simp for them. I think Mowgli specifically, as the kind of spearhead, he's on 0.97 KPI, ne nearly a killer run. He's averaging so well. So he can be the big driving force that can turn that. All right, let's talk about Wolves' opponents. W7M are up on the screen just now. They've won the past two major events. Runners up the last Invitational. They've been called all sorts of things, but they're still looking for that hammer. Jack, can they do it here today? Of course they can. They are the favorites for this competition, whether they're in the upper bracket, the you know the second third place games, or even in the lower bracket, it doesn't matter to them. I think I will say it is a bit of a surprise, again, that we're seeing them in this round one of the upper bracket. They didn't win that group. Now I will say they were in the group of death. Their advantage for winning both majors this year was being placed into the group of death. So it was high quality opponents, but they lost maps. They lost maps against Bleed. They lost maps against Liquid. And they lost a whole best of three in national competition. First time this year against VP. So they are making some mistakes. I think it's particularly to do with the map pool. They're taking teams to 
W7M's weak maps in groups, I think maybe trying to save stuff a little bit for playoffs. Yeah, we're a little bit confused about how they've been playing because they've been playing so, so many maps that we don't know what are they hiding, what are they showing because they want to pretend that they're playing it a lot and that they will let it through in ban phase later on in the tournament. The tournament haven't really started for W7M up until this point. Now is where everything begins because they were always going to go through groups. Group of that, why is it called it? Well, because W7M is in that group. There's no other reason why it is the death group. So they have just everything that they want to do now. They can show any sort of gameplay. The way that they play overall, they are the master of combined arms, is the way I put it. And they know how to play the tempo, the speed, and just overall, every single style of attack they've mastered. Despite that, if it can bleed, we can kill it. And so far, as you both have said, yes, tough group, but they've shown that they can do it. Mapo is something we're gonna have to look into. Maybe that could be improved, and I think Wolves are definitely a good opponent to maybe surprise W7M. And speaking of Mapo, we have our map bands up on the screen. Border Consulate, Bank, and Nighthaven Labs will be taken out first. We'll go to Oregon, that is Wolves' is pick, with W7M starting off uh, on the attacking side. We'll move on to our next map, that is a pick Chalet. Let's go. And that is on W7M. And finally, what will we go to? Well, after banning Skyscraper and Cafe, that will be Clubhouse. Jack, overall thoughts on our map band. So in terms of preferences, these two teams have very, very similar map pools. The maps that they like are very similar. The maps they dislike are very similar. What you've seen in the first uh, ban phase is teams, the both teams are getting rid of maps they don't want to play. Nighthaven has been a perma ban of W7M for a long time. They've got rid of that. Bang, border for Wolves. Makes a lot of sense. So Wolves got the choice to pick from all of the maps they like. They've gone for Oregon. They had Skyscraper available, which Wolves are also excellent at. However, W7M, they lost Oregon going up against Bleed. So I think that's why. They've had a VOD review. They've had a look at that. For W7M, they've picked Chalet. Now, I'll talk about W7M has been one of the best Chalet teams in the world. And I agree with it. I, I agree with my own point. That's weird. Um, <laughs> however, <laughs> thank, you, thank you, thank you. Um, however, Wolves did take W7M to Chalet right as W7M was starting to be unreal in Berlin. Yep. And they won. So Wolves are no slouches at Chalet either. Decider of Clubhouse is very similar. Both teams, high preference map. Fabian, every, every attack round matters here. Every attack round matters. And that's actually the one thing that Wolves have been struggling quite a lot with. Attacks have been their weakness. And if we're looking at Clubhouse, or all the maps really, starting on Oregon even, it's going to be a really, really tough time for them. They need to claw out, I would say, two attacks per map, or I'm going to doubt them a little bit. Who takes map one? I want Wolves to do it, just because of European you. simp. Yeah. But I'm, if I'm being realistic, I think we're leaning a little bit against the W7M 2-0. Jack, game's ready? Yeah, I think Wolves take it. I'm going to... JV said he wanted to be in the lower bracket to me and Fabian just then. <laughs> so I think W7M have got a plan. They want to emulate G2 of last year. Ah, there you go. copycats. The copycats. Big proof of concept. It's, it's the best form of just love and appreciation. But with love and appreciation said, we are ready to go with our game. So let's toss it to our casters. W7M versus Wolves. It's Intero and Pengu. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Milos. It is excellent to hear your voice once again. We went like six months without him, and those were six dreadful months. It's nice to have him back. I missed him. He's like a little sunshine, you know? He walks not, in the room and it's like, ah. He's not little, he's the same height as you. Okay, come on, man. And he didn't, but he didn't wear the ducks this time. Excellent shirt. Thank you. I, well, sweater, I suppose. Yeah, sweater. I quite like the ducks. We're gonna go to Oregon. W7M versus Wolves to start off our very first day. You and I are on the B stream. I honestly feel like I've been on the, or the A stream. I feel like you've been on the B stream every time I've cast it. Every well. time. Do you feel neglected? A little. Well, good Just to have you back little. then. Good to have you back. It's nice to be back, man. Yes. Now, I agree with Fabian's point he said where for WCNM, the run for this Invitationals doesn't really start until this second phase. And I, I had this note in my own book here saying, were they holding back question mark? Because the WCNM that we've seen so far in groups has not really been to the same level of skill and consistency and excitement on the player face cams as one would expect. So I want to see right now if they can do it. And then you just come on with an absolute heater because I as well am predicting here a 2-0 like Fabian was like. I don't want to say it, but that probably should be the outcome. I like the Nomad ban. Fenrir being banned is not really that much of a surprise. You saw on the pre-show the numbers for the defenders. Valkyrie, Warden, Solus, Azami, and Fenrir are the five most picked defenders. And what do all five of them have in common? Well, they are 
significantly challenging to deal with at the moment. Attackers not exactly having the greatest amount of tools at their disposal to deal with these defenders, which is why we are witnessing an absolutely dominant defense time and time again. Every single map in the map pool is extremely lopsided in favor of the defenders at this point. Two Brown will be the very final ban removed from action, so we will not see any of the newest operator in Rainbow Six. But the thing is, with w and m we see them often ban two bro, but we also know they can leave it open and even play it themselves because earlier in the group phase against VP on Cafe, that was the scenario. So I do feel at w and m they have things they've been working on, you know, behind the scenes, in scrims and practice, that they're kind of waiting for their time, for their turn to show these things. And if you are a back-to-back -back major winning team, and basically everyone's gunning for you, everyone's looking at you, how you're innovating the game, how you're performing. Why not keep things a little bit on the low end and start showing them when it's necessary? Because if you expose all your new stuff in the very beginning of a tournament, well, it's not going to be a surprise later on against the quote-unquote stronger teams. And of course, in that either lower bracket if you lose early when it matters the absolute most, or to stay in that upper bracket to maintain your advantage. So I do expect some new things here from WCM, or at the very least, a revitalized kind of performance. They are starting on a tertiary bomb site. Yes, <laughs> that is a little peculiar. This is mm, the first round, right? Yeah. No, not a rehost. The round count is zero zero. You would not be incorrect to assume that maybe something happened. No, they are starting on meeting and kitchen. This is very abnormal for Oregon, especially because that basin bomb site is so strong for the defending side, which is where it dumps them. They'll be starting. It was not a bomb site. I think you looked away. Either way, you want to keep them on their toes, right? Wolves choose this map. W7M go to the side that they like. Obviously, defense right now is far more favorable for everybody. There's going to be early action. Everywhere, actually. In fact, I'm just fighting it out. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what's happening. Everybody is <laughs> coming to blows. Case is down. No. KZ pulling off two in a row. His third in the round, leaving P4 against KZ. KZ looking for the 4K. We're only a minute on in. P4 knows exactly where that Solus is. Oh. He manages to get away. Well played Attack by KZ. The bomb Could have easily been picked off there if he'd not respected P4, who will now have plenty of time to drone. Yep, consider that drone for the flank, try and go for a plant beta, but it's Casey with Solus. He has this into exactly where the planet is going down and how far into it he is. It's a bait and switch now, with still half the round to go. P4 has to make the brain play to lure out Casey's position. Casey's gonna have some information on this. He pops Ten up at P4 Ten to go. with the Five shutout at the very end. Great start by Wolves. I mean, you can almost argue there that both teams, they booted up a TDM here, not the actual pro lobby, because within 20 seconds, early engagements, back and forth trading in the bomb side, yes, it was in meeting and kitchen, but the lobby was pretty much where most of those deaths they happened besides the bomb side itself, and a very big surprise, and Wolves, we know they have kind of two modes. They have they're relatively like slow, structured, methodical, you expect that kind of pacing. And then they have the go, go, in your face kind of style. And if you're Wolves going into this Oregon map, which Wolves picked, by the way, mind you, you probably watched Bleed play up against WCMM on this exact map of Oregon, and you saw that the way Bleed actually won their rounds was by playing overly aggressive with confidence, catching WCMM by surprise, and trying to just be in their face and not give them any space to work with. This very first opening round from Wolves was very much orchestrated in a similar way, where they said, we gotta get in there fast, we gotta get in there quickly, and it is early mornings here, just 10 a.m. local time. If you're not an early riser, you've yet to really wake up. Was it back uh, not too long ago when I think it was TSM was playing every single matchup early on, Nick? And it was kind of like, oh, we have to be up at 8 a.m. every day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that could be a little bit of a challenge, especially if you're still adapting to a different time zone, which is what it seems some of these teams had a problem with doing earlier on. There's a reason why you see some of the bigger orgs will send their teams to go and do uh, a boot camp in the region 
in which they are competing in. M80 was here for a week, for example, mm. beforehand. I know that Dark Zero was also in Brazil for a while, and I believe G2 was as well. Mowgli almost dies in the ensuing fight, as this is a very active defense from W7M. They pick off Deadshot first. And now both the Ash and the IQ are running together. Herds with a C4, blowing both of them up. And now it's KZ on Armory Stairs to loop around and go after Shinka inside of meeting. Shinka's just gonna <laughs> drop. What are we witnessing here? P4 with a single kill. That's all she's gonna get. Two rounds in a row. That we just, we just saw wolves run right in. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the round there, it, 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 they, they win or they lose on the roam clear. And what was actually a great start for wolves, where, you know, Deadshot and, uh, and Mowgli, they're just running in together trying to get off that trade game. Well, the issue is the C4 takes down both players. So Mowgli slowing down, waiting for backup, looked really good on paper, but because he actually ended up slowing things down, the C4 does more damage than it otherwise would have done, and it kind of just like destroys Wolves on the roam. It's forcing out that really quick out of nowhere hat drop because you're playing a, a game of desperation, essentially, trying to get back that advantage by just getting a kill or two. We see right here from Hertz, he gets one, he gets both, and there it is. So when things like that happen, dropping the heads immediately, I get it. You're 2v4, you can't breach anything, you can't really get any advantages, there's no utility left on your lineup either. You just have two guns, you gotta make the most of it. Try and catch your phone in by surprise again. But W7M, very much ready to match this aggression in the first two rounds. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Might have a, a re-host here. Some Something yeah. crashed. Yeah. Definitely so. go for Rios here. Gotta get quickly back into the server. Gotta make sure that we get that 5v5 action. No one's missing out. <laughs> it's like, man, it's only the second round, and now these guys are crashing. What is going on? Ah, uh, good vibes. Of course. When you're so ready and amped up for a match, it can actually kind of throw you off of your game here by being forced into a break. We've seen how both teams have matched each other playing extremely quick in the first two rounds. Having a quote-unquote global timeout now where both teams just got to sit there, you can't really talk to your teammates because it's a technical timeout, and, um, well, you just got to sit there. Ready yourself mentally, but okay, when the server starts again, we got to go, 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 get straight back into it and not sit still for too long. You're not allowed to talk during these tech pauses. For those that might be uh, wondering why some of the teams sit there in complete and total silence, it's not that they are antisocial. <laughs> Difference is obviously when you're playing on LAN, you can communicate with your teammates because you have the admin team standing right behind you. Yeah. Obvious issue is that, as far as I'm aware. Admins don't speak every language. So if you've got a team, you know, calming and say Japanese, what are the odds that the admin behind them is actually able to understand them at all? That rule change went in about tech issues just to step around any potential tomfoolery involving, <laughs> oh no, my PC crashed, and now you effectively get another timeout. Not that teams did that, but just in the off chance. You see it there, yeah, the admin saying, saying no allowed, talking. No talking, you're not allowed to talk. Yeah. It's funny because when you look at like the history of WCNM, you can say that they are technically still kind of new to international events. They're kind of still like a little bit of a rookie, but because of how well they've done winning back-to-back -back majors, making SI finals last year, they also are arguably more experienced than most rosters at the Six Invitationals right now. So they're in this weird kind of position where they're young, they don't know the exact workarounds of like, can you talk to a tech situation or not, you know? Because they haven't been to that many events. They've just done incredibly well for themselves at the handful of events they have been at. Whereas for Wolves, very st different story. They've been to every single event going back like a year and a half, two years, but they've never really made it past top Eight. Usually they'll go home in groups or they'll go home in quarters. 
Of course, there are singular instances where that might not be the case. Invitationals last year, they got sixth, for example. But typically speaking, Wolves, they're always going to be on your screen at a major, but they will also just not really go past the quarters. So they're not going to make it far into the main stage. And of course, that's the goal for every single team. Yes, get experience at a major event, but also playing in front of a crowd is the goal and dream of every single team. And it also means you are one step closer to actually lifting that trophy, because once the crowd is there, there are just three games between you and the trophy. There's the quarterfinal, the semifinal, and the grand final. So once you hear the crowds roar, you know that you're close. Hasn't been a Brazilian crowd that's been able to play an international event in front of Brazilians since all the way back in 2018. The Rio finals occurred in November 2018, which of course you won. True. I'm sure the crowd is delighted that you defeated their hometown team of FaZe Clan. <laughs> I'm not sure they seem delighted, <laughs> but I will say Fabian had the coldest pre-game interview ever. We walks up in front of that big crowd and he tells, I think it was cameraman at the time, he's like, I am sorry for you because you will be responsible for all these people's feelings when we beat you. And he was stunned on the stage when like, how do I how do I make a comeback out of this? He just roasted me and said that I'm responsible for all these people because we Five will lose. Left. That's a mental boom right there. So there's a bit of mind games, of course. Crowd Attack control and uh, playing to the minds of your opponent. That was a 2-0, wasn't it? It was a quick 2-0. <laughs> yeah. That was back when the Pro League Finals were only three maps. So if you were a dominant team, you could have a very brief hour and 45 minute affair and walk home with the trophy as you did that time. Capping off an incredibly impressive year for you. That was the same year as the Paris Major, for those that mm. were not aware. You obviously prevailed in that one. You did lose Atlantic City that year, though, to a Brazilian team. But then you went yeah. on to win SI right after. You did not make the Milan Finals. Someone's got to check their windows. There you go. <laughs> Gotta, you know, you always got to make sure that the, the firewall, the Windows firewall is working just fine. No intruders will be made here. Safety first. Next. Shing with the bees to take armory control and kind of just now we see a more structured wolves. I said earlier how they can change up their play style between the more passive structured version and aggressive when they got to go. But we see here the setup, big window, kids don't repel, two bottom right. I think they're going to do a 3 2 one call down and rush yep. the bomb side. And they're in. This will be the third round in a row that wolves are very quick to the punch. They've not been able to strike first, though. W7M has expected this every single time, been able to gun them down. Ooh. KZ slaughtering Shinka. And unless Bibu can get a single pick here, it'll be a flawless round for this Brazilian squad. Bibu knows somebody's down below. Fellpox trying to get his attention. Hmm. Bibu can get pushed from top white. I don't know if W7M knows exact whereabouts. Discipline here from the defending side. Yeah, it's a 5v1, but why give him anything here? Just hold your ankle, sit tight, and let him, let him do the work. He has to come to you. You have bomb side control. This is the world champions or major champions of WCM playing right now. Ouch. Well, nothing much to be done. Still the same part of the map. And he engaged, Nade watching it, and he, losing the, he loses out on that duel to Nade. A flawless defense from W7M. Now, Wolves have gone for very quick executes, three rounds in a row on this map. What do you think is the thought process behind this? This is their map. They are starting on the unfavorable side. Are you thinking that maybe because it is such a defender-sided map that going quickly will be able to get ahead of it? Mm. Do you think they're hoping to catch W7 off guard? I do think it's a mixture of both of those points, but also if you're prepping for Oregon specifically, which of course Wolves they have since they picked this map, you saw the bleak game. And the way that W7 they're playing, their positioning, their operators are playing, they're not one-to-one -one with that against bleed. And this is the issue. This is why I make the note myself. I'm like, did W7 hold back a little bit in group stage and not really play to their true self? Because it was a bit sloppier. It was far more inconsistent. The crossfires weren't there. They weren't trading when they were dying. 
But now in the first three rounds, the trades, they are hitting their marks. Whenever somebody from WCM will die, they will always get one or two kills back, punishing Wolves. And now all of a sudden, they're playing Frost. And Wolves obviously did not expect that Operator. They rushed into the big window. No one shot the Frost mat. Nobody checked for it. Didn't have the time to drone. So immediately, the second they go for a bombsite rush, one person gets injured off the Frost mat. That gives off the sign that, oh, hey, they're actually in. Everybody, be alert. Look at where the entry points are. And they shut down the white staircase. They shut down the big window jump in. And Wolves, they don't even get a single kill in the round. And against Bleed, again, top is they roam a lot. Now they're playing close side chain. And now with the opening kill to open things up, JV falls early in this round. A good look for Wolves. Wolves have been so fast. So, so fast at assessing map control. And we'll continue onwards. This time working out a little bit better than in previous rounds. Two unanswered kills for Wolves with W7M now. Pushed onto their back foot. I like the IQ as well, still doing work while the rest of the team circles around this tertiary bomb site, which was the very first site that W7M went to. Nitro cells will go out, but nobody getting hit just yet. Everybody's still upright for Wolves, as we're only a minute into action. Again, this brisk pace will set Wolves up nicely for the remainder of the round. Yeah, Deadshot doing great job here in the IQ, just finding those pre-play C4s, alerting his teammates, and using grenades to destroy utility. Again, grenades with the nerf to normally be able to be cooked, means you can't get kills with them as much as you would like to. Mowgli walks down wide staircase, takes down KC, and now Wolves are looking at the bomb side. They're isolating Nade and Felipox. Is there the logic bombs as well? Felipox striking back, missing out on another potential kill. And now it's Nade over in showers as his position is known to Wolves. He'll just have to tr trudge on, soldier on. Diffuser going down from Shinka. He's the lowest member in terms of HP. The other two from Wolves, all perfectly healthy. And watching this mirror window as Nade reassesses. Deadshot holding on to this and deciding for an engagement, still searching for his first kill. He'll get it after the Diffuser gets planted. Wolves tying the game. Getting those points there with the plan, of course. Now, the one thing about Wolves is that no matter what style they're showing, Mowgli will always be a constant, always the aggressor, always trying to secure as much map control as possible. And I think that's going to be their key way to win up here against WCM. If Mowgli is allowed freedom and can take map control and get those opening kills, that is when Wolves, they shine. When they can actually successfully get past the first point of entry. When we see Wolves get the opening kill, they look phenomenal. However, when they lose the opening engagements, everything kind of stalls out on multiple bodies start falling apart. We see here, Mowgli really quickly, 40 seconds of the round, they've taken top block control, to walk down the white staircase. Mowgli then, very disciplined, will sprint back up the staircase, stabilize with his team, they get the vertical control, they get additional pick, and then Mowgli is once again allowed to be unleashed upon the bomb site and find that entry engagement. And even if Mowgli dies, because it's 5v3 or 5v2, you get intel on the whereabouts of the like, last few remaining defenders, and his teammates can act upon it. We saw it there, the hat drop, walking into a a certain that plant dominance and now Jack Wolves they time things up 2-2 back to a basement bombs and attack and they're gonna show us a very different set of operators the grim the twitch the blitz things might be changing up operator wise but I still think it'll be another quick round a great oh. reach from Mowgli straight to the barricade door again the prep work really paying off Hurts has been playing that position in multiple games at this event on Oregon before have we seen this so far at Six Invitational where Every single opening pick has come within the first 30 seconds of the round. Another will be added to it this time the wrong way for Wolves as Deadshot is outdueled by KZ, who has been simply phenomenal so far. Prior to the rehost, KZ had, I think it was five kills, if memory serves me correctly. He's having a very good event so far. I mean, he always does. The three main threats for W7M of Herds, KZ, and JV92 always tend to show up. And it's no surprise to see KZ picking up exactly where he left off from the Atlanta Major. Having those three be able to outduel just about everybody they run across, Nick, is a huge part of why W7M continue to be the best team in the world at the moment. Though they didn't finish top of their group. So, obviously, there's some weakness there. Wolves looking to capitalize on that with their four quick rounds. Now for a fifth round, they started off strong, but have taken a step back as they attack this laundry supply room basement defense down below. They will go on to drones back to Discovery and ensure that the remaining half of the round 
is as sophisticated as what they were hoping for in the first. No, you're right. They didn't stop their group. They were beaten out by Virtus Pro, who's had a really good run themselves, and actually beat WCM 2 to 1 in terms of map count. And that's why WCM they're here right now, and not in VP's shoes. A 4v4 right now at Warden off the board is not the worst spot to be in. B1 Blitz has two smoke grenades. She's still got five Bs on P4 on the Grim. So I would argue the attack inside, you have the utility that you need that you want for this execute. All you gotta do now is execute cleanly. Most importantly, get that opening kill, find that 4v3, get the man advantage. Because when you got the Blitz, you kind of have one gun less on the board. He's great for the push, but he's great for the aggression, but he can't really shoot back all that much. There's the Blitz, the B-Boo is... Nate gets two kills with a single Goyo canister. Mowgli's been phenomenal so far through this round. Wolves offense tends to live and die off of him. He won't get the ace as Bibu taking out KZ, leaves just JV92, his last alive. And here's the Blish, the Blitz to rush on in and take out JV92 in the process. Three rounds for Wolves on this first half. Three rounds on attack on Oregon. That's a great start. That's a round that feels really good because the team coordination in the 4v4 was so good from Wolves. They make the quick decision. Blitz actually, Bebo, sprinting through the Goyo canister fire to do an off-pace play, but he did wait about 18 seconds. What that means is if the Goyo fire lasts for 20 and you wait 18, the Blitz will be in at a very big surprising moment in the round, but there's, a, there's only two seconds left for the fight to disappear, which means the follow-up gunfight from behind the Blitz can walk in shortly after without taking that damage from the fire, not him to spread in with a gun down, and therefore you still catch your opponents by surprise, but you still have to back up right behind the blitz with only those one or two seconds missing. So it's great stuff there from Bibu, the captain, calling the shots, and then we see Mowgli just right in there, finding a double kill. We actually saw two members <laughs> die to the Goyo Cannister fire, so the only damage here in the execute was to utility. Now, Parker, you talked about how quickly these opening kills are happening. W7M going into the series, the second quickest team at getting the opening kill, only behind G2, who's the quickest at this event, but Wolves are like top four or top five. So basically, both of these two teams are in the top five category of quickest entries, but the average is like a minute and 10, minute and 15 seconds for them. This is way quicker again. than a minute. It's 15 seconds in these rounds. This has got to be sending a world record pace for both teams battling it out on both sides. I mean, Wolves doing their homework, as you said, that data shows you how fast W7M can be, and this is a team that popularized the heavy roam. There's a period of time where defenders would roam but not be anywhere near as aggressive as we saw W7M getting, and then they showed up on the scene, and they were everywhere, all at once, all over the map. I mean, they benefited from the fact that they had a roster that could pull it off, so yeah. when you get the right players who can do it, why not? W7M losing Fella Pox early, so am I? That is a devastating blow. Three operators for W7M, by the way, have access to gadgetry that continues to generate the longer it goes on, but Wolves are just inside the site. We are a minute into the round. Diffuser going down, Shinka with it in hand. There are the logic bombs. Goodbye to Deadshot. Shinka gets Diffuser down successfully, and now we scramble in the post plant. There we do. Not a great one. They got a hold of the bombs of control because it can't play out to the big windows. They gotta stay on site if you're Wolves. Gunfire still going. KZ retaking. He's got a triple. Herds is down, so it's effectively a 2v2. They're getting him back, but oh. no! KZ with the quad kill, looking for the last one. He has Shinka lined up inside, and it's the ace for him. Technically, JV92 secures the kill, but KZ had the down, so you're splitting hairs over it. But either way, a Herculean performance. And that is kill 13, 14, or 15 for KZ. We need to see the number based on what happened before the rehoused. Very impressive stuff. W7M replaced by a single player at the moment. And all the long faces for Wolves, as you know it falls on them saying, if only we'd killed the one guy. <laughs> if only they got that one kill. But the thing is, where they planted was necessary, right? They had the kid storm wall with feet holes. We see it right here. You cannot plant close by the window. You gotta push in deep behind the mattress bunk bed and then go to the plant. The downside of that is you cannot play outside the big window. You have to stay on the bomb side. Or maybe if P4 has soft vision on Sophia, he could go downstairs, do some vertical control. But the big saving grace here is Casey on the attic rotate finds P4. This Sophia from behind, right?
right before he gets the double kill. So that could have been a one versus two in favor of Wolves, or it can come down to a three or two v one like it ended up at for W7M. So the details right now really deciding on a lot of these things, the timings, the understanding. I think you can argue that should Wolves have gone so fast, given they got the open and kill one in a stable position, maybe, maybe not. But Wolves did get in the bomb side. They did get the plant down. I would say the attack succeeded, but the retake there from W7M just too strong, too much to handle, and this is the downside of playing W7M. They have really strong players in all five positions. Anyone can step up, they can clutch up. So in that round, yeah, you're gonna take down KC, but then maybe in a couple of rounds, you gotta worry about Philly Pox or Nade or Hertz or JV. Every single player is so capable. That's the issue with W7M. Not a whole lot of weaknesses. Nobody's like really falling behind in terms of numbers. Everyone's stepping up, but that's the first half in the books. Three, three sides. So given it's a defender side at Oregon, statistically so far in this tournament, it's a really good start for Wolves though, despite losing that last round. Obviously Wolves are not, uh, not gonna be happy with the score lines. They thought that they could get more. And as we saw, the faces tell that full story, right? They look obviously devastated with that final round and go all the way back to, <laughs> well, <laughs> go all the way back to round number two where the brawl ultimately broke in favor of W7M and Wolves could very easily see this be a 5-1 or a 4-2 scoreline in their possession, which would be excellent. Now, W7M are a bit more sluggish on their pace. We're a minute in and everybody is still alive, though W7M are taking up space over towards Freezer. Downstairs bomb site for Wolves to start off this second half. Mm. And W7M know what needs to be done. Now, a lot of teams are foregoing a blue execute these days. We're seeing a lot more freezer and laundry takes. And I wonder, will there be any blue play from W7M? Right now, the answer is no. Shinka is standing over in either blue or elbow, and that's just about it. I mean, you got this opening lineup of like Capital, Osa, Twitch, Brava, Maverick. You cannot go fast. All your operators depend on active utility. You gotta just like go through the motions right now because this will be a five man versus five man execute. That's what W7 they want. They got the tools for it. They got fire for the corners. They got Brown for the intel. They got Osa for the coverage here. So we see the cutoff. Osa shield bottom freezer. That gives KC protection if you get swung because you're expecting aggression. Now Felipox on the capital has to stop things off. Where that fire and smoke go, that's gonna be the indicator of where the execute will come on through. So we see two bottom laundry two bottom threes there, and one back that big tower. This will be a front-sided execute. Philip Hawks playing behind the shield now with fire as well to try and isolate. He got hit by a magnet, and there it goes. He's elevated. Bibu is above. There's a grenade in front of him. Mowgli will walk back as now Bibu drops down and has a good line of sight over towards Freezer. Mowgli understands where this is coming from, but W7M are prepared for it. Nade behind the talent shield, getting Diffuser down. Mowgli finished off. KZ yet another kill. He's been sensational so far. Herds and Nade felled as the timer's running out, and we literally got sent out of the map. It's up to Felipox to do something here, but Deadshot gets the final two kills and prevent this W7M team from taking up even greater space inside the bomb site. Wolves their first lead since all the way back in round number one. P4 really is the hero right now for Wolves though. We saw him clutch out in a one versus one in the very first opening round and we just saw him get the plant denial with the only C4 utility available to the defense and the follow-up swing SMG living kill shortly after, shutting down the plant execute from W7M. And strategically, it was a really great attacking, uh, attacking round. There was only one real weakness there. A single C4, if not shot mid-air, or if you can't really stabilize afterwards, that is going to stop the the entire push and because of B4's position the C4 comes from such an awkward angle behind the wall no one really gets to see it or hear it no one is quite ready for it but we saw the idea behind the attack the castle fire for laundry was supposed to take down people it doesn't he read the situation he vaulted on the laundry machine and he stayed alive sure he died later in the round to a gunplay instead but it's gonna be fire laundry rotate Ozzy shield goes down plant behind the Ozzy shield round should then be over 
the issue is the downside of OCP being known to plant left. is that you only get to use one shield. You walk in, you put down the shield, you start planting, and if you die to a C4 impact grenade, there's no the more bomb. shields in play. Whereas the OZ didn't die, you could have taken that freezer shield oh. on elsewhere again, but KC happened again. Again, 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 again. Eight seconds into the round, but this time from the opposite end. It's the attackers again, but this time WSNM getting down the shutdown onto Mowgli. Devastating that's the Azami that's gone too. Oh, yeah. How many of those Kiba barriers do you think have been put down at this point, or is there a possibility that he died with every single one of them? in pocket because I'm looking at the site set up right now and at least from the vantage point that I have I don't see a single Kiva barrier present Nick yeah I mean it's he had two available to him but as you said he might not have used them yet because he's not going to expect to die on the spawn peak right but that happens sometimes and obviously when they're quick to the punch inside of armory got open and kill only in 45 seconds here KC 12 kills not counting rehost Reload. this man right now has to be stopped if you're wolves if you let him have such a high performance game he's gonna have so much confidence to just keep going through you yeah, i really wish we hadn't had the rehost because we've lost that information obviously oh small struggles from nade who will now confront the other mute jammer that is on the back of this game's wall We'll wait very patiently for no well i was gonna say maybe a pocket emp in the hands of kz or maybe they just shoot the jammer from below it looks like they were able to get it with the gone six while placed yeah and now the wall will open up you have a kill hole on the left side of that panel and you have an entryway on the right this is a dorm's bomb site so you can walk in and get the diffuser planted relatively Break fast out. w7m answering back is now they're just in the site yeah, you get some utility work done from Wolves with the killing so far. Favors the Brazilian squad. KZ might not have that kill on the Grim. Past kill number one of the round, but now he's using utility work to enable the rest of his team as he walks forward from Trophy. KZ picks up number two, and it's all up to P4, who will subdue KZ but not finish him off. Still playing inside of dorms as they feed themselves to him one by one by one. Nade getting Diffuser down. It's all up to JV92 to cover. As Nade now will pull off of the plant. And that kill hole that was established early on by W7M will be used to great success. Keeps P4 from pushing up to the Diffuser, allowing W7M to get out of position. And now over in White Stairs, P4 has shotgun in hand. Oh. Nice play on to Nade. A fourth kill is his if he can find JV92. He'll hop on Diffuser. JV92 needs to get there in a hurry. He falls off, Ooh. and it's just a couple bullets from the Zofia to give this round to W7M. And both of these teams cannot shake each other, Nick. 4-4 four, four is the scoreline. A very close attempt there for P4 once again, almost finding a third round for his team, but the crossfire was arguably there. The rotations were good from W7M, and... I mean, the big thing right now is just the read from both teams on each other. They have such a good understanding of the timing as to when to go for the aggressive play and when to fall back. And I noticed that WCM made a conscious decision. They had KC with Ian Pocket in peace right next to the breach wall, yet it was still Buck rotating outside the building using a gun six. What this means is they valued having one more EMP in the pocket as a higher value factor than the gun six soft breach from the Buck. And it makes sense if you gotta walk in through a door, deal with traps, etc., maybe shut down the C4. And it's just good decision making here from the attack and lineup. I will say a bit of a. Uh, solo play here in the four versus one where two members ended up dying and getting injured and kind of falling apart early on but when you have two members up alive jv postman at a master bedroom that is all you need to secure that round he's in such a strong position p4 is very low on hp and while they respected the shotgun by walking down the wide staircase he still snipes the opponent Attackers all the way from top light it's four four tied up no one's counted out shing is playing ella things about to get crazy <laughs> All right, we're 10 seconds into the round and nobody's died yet. So That's crazy. Slow round. Tertiary bomb site is over on meeting. Wasn't a tertiary site for W7M whatsoever when they uh, when they went on to defense here. Loading back in round number one, we surprised both you and I. Yeah. KZ on 13 kills, by the way. Nine <laughs> for the rest of W7M. You heard me correctly. Four players, nine kills. KZ, 13 kills. And again, that's just from the rehost. We know for a fact that KZ had three rounds, or sorry, three kills in the very first round. Mm. So the fact that he's at this number already is astonishing. Not just in terms of kills, but 
honestly, huge value at the moment. As you can see, he's using IQ, and there is a ton of gadgetry that he can find, and he's finding them very fast. Yeah, the yeah, IQ is shaving up this round in its entirety. He finds the Valk Cam destroying the C4. No one dies on vert play. That means that, again, the attack inside is very quickly here, destroying the floor, taking map control, and overseeing the bomb side. Deathshot, if he drops, there's a player waiting for him. Bebo's trying to get the read here, but he might have the wrong idea. The buck, the barrel of the gun was shown. I thought oh. Bibu saw that, but oh. apparently not. And Herds will pick up two kills before retreating over towards Pillar. He wants more of that engagement. All the while, the remaining players from W7M inching closer to the bomb site. JV2 maybe a little too close as JV92 is picked apart. First one to die from W7M, despite the fact that Wolves suffered two casualties. And most damningly, it's the smoke that is off the board for the final minute. I will say that the reason why they died makes sense. They want to help Deadshot drop down the hatch and escort him back towards safety. So they send three players in the basement because surely three against one means you will be the winner. But no, Deadshot walks up through the stairs, gets the kill, but Casey finds two more in this round, making it 15 to his tally. How many multi-kills does he have? Um, he is fast approaching 20 kills. Now, the most that he can get is a single kill more in this round as P4 is over by stage. Not too far removed from that bomb chassis and he misses and KZ gets it. This is just an absolutely phenomenal start by KZ. 16 kills. Yeah, I mean, two things are true around. P4 is the last alive of Wolves every single round and KC will get as many multi-kills as is humanly possible. Now, Wolves, on, on the end of that round, will call their tactical timeout. And I think this is a good, a good point. Right? You're down one round, it's four to five, not the end of the world. You gotta step up now on your defensive side because despite statistics saying defense is favored, attackers right now are more often than not controlling the pace of these rounds. It really is stunning to see how the attackers are doing as well as they are. I mean, ultimately, through the nine rounds of action that have been played, it's five rounds in favor of the attackers, four rounds in favor of the defenders. So it's not quite lopsided, Nick, but it isn't as dominant a defensive round or defensive set of rounds as we come to expect. Now, it's worth noting that this is Wolf's map pick. Yeah. So the fact that W7M have the lead at the moment and seem to be in control of an awful lot of these rounds would bode well for them moving on to Chalet, which we will see no matter what. Clubhouse, of course, is the tiebreaker. There's no guarantee that we're going to see Clubhouse at all. But I made this comment a couple rounds ago about oh, that second shot on Mowgli is just... The read is so Yeah, good. it's ridiculous. Good Lord. It's just pre-fires. Yeah. Herds and KZs. Phenomenal. The point I was making earlier, I wanted to see if there was anything we could glean from that, and then I realized that neither team speaks English. <laughs> Good job, Parker. <laughs> Whoopsies. <laughs> it happens. The point that I was trying to make earlier, Five, that I will now get to three. finally a third time, is that that first half being a 3-3 split, a couple yeah, of those rounds were real to coin toss. Oh, yeah. W7M could have, in theory, be on match point or even done right now, depending on what happens in those first couple rounds. So, Wolves, obviously, they or suffer the same fate, but you can't look at it that way. You just got to keep going and fight for these next two rounds if you're Wolves and hope that W7 don't take both of them. But what really shows to me more than anything is how evenly matched these teams have been. If KZ starts getting shut down or maybe he misses a couple shots or mm. there's a round or two where he's not much of a factor, W7M have threats. But so far, they haven't really been needed. I wonder if Wolves can try and maybe play a little bit safer on defense because the pace of these rounds so far seem to benefit W7M. It's a slower round now for round number 10 as Wolves go back downstairs to Laundry Supply. They were successful here the first time they defended it back in round seven. I mean, one of the big differences is that Wolves often rely on Mowgli to be the aggressor in finding those picks, where, and he's like a very big injury player. He will swing every gunfight, whereas KC often like a more flexible, more like late back roll. He's playing IQ, he's playing Twitch. He's often alive for like the mid to late round, whereas Mowgli will often die or get kills early on. So the difference is one team has their clutch performer throughout the entirety of the round, and the other team 
in Wolves in this case, will lose their quote unquote star player usually very early. Moku seems to be host, only 6 and 6, not bad whatsoever, but he is the one to die first for his team I'm more reloading. often than not. And you really want him alive for these 5v5 executes to go crazy when things get chaotic. By attackers. Talk to the, the very first execute onto this bomb site that. Blue control is not exactly something that the attackers grab, but they've posted herds up in this position. There's a smoke to go. Shotgun goes out. So close. They're tantalizingly close. But then you also hear the MPX, a Mowgli, who assassinates JV92 on backstairs. He'll provide the cross to ensure that Shinka doesn't die inside of Blue. KZ over towards Freezer as herds actually gets Shinka. Where was Mowgli looking? There goes some of the fire and the bees as well in front of Bibu to hold him in place as he sits reversed behind that deployable shield. Yeah. Right now, it's obviously, they're kind of locked out of his position, but so, oh my god, they're sniping bottom laundry. No one's watching the crosses from the defensive side, but the trade is good there for Wolves. Deadshot will walk back. Herds has an opportunity. They know where he is. KZ is last to clutch out, and he can't get it done. He falters. Is that the first round that we saw where KZ didn't? <laughs> Get a kill? <laughs> it might actually be the first I time. need to see because obviously action happens so quickly. But first round all game where KZ does not get a kill. That's the question that I am asking. We're waiting for confirmation. Team's tied 5-5. Five, five, and yes, KZ did not get a kill that round. Wow. Okay. Not that it was really that important. I mean, the structure of W7M was not great that time. I like the crossfire from Pillar. I like the hole that yeah. they had inside Laundry. I really like the freezer hold from Deadshot. So Wolves blunting whatever momentum that you would think W7M has. And now we will go to all 12 rounds. Oh yeah, we will. It will be a close first map here. The one only issue for W7M, they lost Maverick on the big tower stairs very early, which means that they, they're they lacking pressure on one of the four fronts they're attacking from. They had one freezer, one laundry, one meeting hatch, one big tower stairs, and one outside uh, blue double door. What that means, they have five players in very isolated positions, and you really want all those five members to go at the same time. You have three, two, one countdown. That's when people, they aggress. The thing is, the Mavic on big tower stairs didn't aggress at all. Mowgli pushed into him. He was just holding an angle, but that's the dangerous part about Siege. If you can have a drone watch an angle for you, and the drone gets shot into the player, you stay alive. But if you hold it with your face, with your gun, and somebody comes there and they win the gunfight, all of a sudden, you're playing four versus five. And not having pressure from all sides gives Mokli the freedom to the pillar to hold one single angle. The meeting has drop, and it shuts down the entire push there. So good setup, good read from Wolves once again. It's 5-5, five, five, and W7M, they're doing the same thing as last time on Kid Storm's attack. They're all hovering towards Armory, Master Bedroom Balcony, trying to play as many guns in one position to shut down Mowgli on the offensive room here inside of Armory Hallway. You got word that there were four kills from KZ before the rehost, by the oh. way. So he's sitting at 20 kills, Okay, if that is to be believed. 20 kills through 11 rounds is unheard of. He's going to be on ace. He's already used two of those Selma charges so far. But Herds has been heating up as well. Herds has a couple multi-kill rounds. Maybe not to match KZ, but to at least show that there's life on the other players of W7M. And it's not just a one-man show. This is partially what makes this W7M team such a threat, Nick, is that anybody can show up. Yeah, Felipox and Nade don't usually do it, but that's because their roles don't necessitate it. But when you've got JV92 and Felipox, or you've got JV92 and Herds, along with the support of Nade and Felipox, that's what ultimately rounds out the rest of this team. Get ready! But KZ has been a monster and just in a league of his own so far. Exact same mute jammer spot cleared out by the Gone Six. This is an identical setup yeah. onto this closet wall that we saw from W7M back in round number eight. Yeah, they want the same take. They were ahead with last time, so Souls, but a small royalty towards big window right now from the capital of JV92. He's going to look to be the backstabber right now, create some chaos and force these positions from also to be moved around with the capital fire and smokes, perhaps. If he can take enough attention or just bait it out by punching the barricade and rotate elsewhere, that's going to keep the defenders guessing as to what the exact take will be, because normally where capital goes, there goes the plant as well. The tussle. It's slowly leading up inside of Attic as one player from Wolves looks a bit disconnected from whatever the push might be. JV92 was on Big Window before. He was on Upside Down Repel. Now he has time to go on to Drone and assess. Where are these 
fatal entry points for this team. JV92 still has full utility for the Capital, but as you can see how quickly Mowgli gets out of there after being droned out, you have to follow up on that intel very quickly. Yep. In goes, oh my god, KC, no way he wins that. I almost thought he had a second yes. there as well. Mowgli falters to Nade. Ooh. KC in another. A third will not be at hand as Shinka takes him down and grabs a second for his trouble, pulling out the sidearm. He's playing keep away inside of dorms. Nade needs to get in and get the diffuser. He relies an awful lot on Velipox, who won't have time. And Deadshot was playing down below. Wolves will move to map point. The only thing that can stop KC in these gunfights is just surprising him with the sheer amount of manpower in his pathway. He finds two kills instead of Kid Storms, and yet there's a third. So he drops down Attic into Pit, thinking it's clear, I can advance, I can sprint, my gun doesn't matter, etc. It's gotta be clear. Shinga, the third defending member in the same similar position, is not accounted for. He shuts things down, and with that, the round goes to Wolves. And you can argue that Casey should never win won the, the gunfight jumping in attic window towards the big tower, but he does. Of course he does. When you're sitting on like these like 20 something kills at this point, you know that you're winning gunfights. You have no business winning. Frustrating individual round though. If you're putting up these kinds of numbers, landing these kinds of shots, but you still lose the round. You feel like you did so much. And you did. It was a 2v4 slash 2v5 with Shinka, the anchor player for Wolves. He's the person who excels on the Warden, who locks things down with consistency. The backbone of every team will be the anchor player. And when he stays up and he locks down the bomb side, the team is doing well. Attackers are moving to defeat the bomb. You and I were sitting waiting for this matchup to begin and the desk was doing their thing. They were desking all over the place. <laughs> and we heard the W7M chant and oh, yeah. it was deafening. And that's just it being picked up by what I imagine were the, whatever, the ambient mics in the room. I don't even know if they were on yet. Maybe it was getting picked up from the desk headsets. But either way, both of these teams are capable of being exceptionally loud. You heard it there. Wolves have good reason to celebrate. I mean, these are the defending major champions. They made it to the SI Finals in Montreal last year. Position secured. Now, they have an opportunity to do the same thing, but on home soil. And I can only imagine how loud that crowd would be with a Brazilian team playing in the finals. I mean, both of the events that have gone to Brazil so far have had a Brazilian team in the finals. And beat Black Dragons all the way back in Sao Paulo. You beat FaZe Clan back in 2019. So I guess their kryptonite is just playing an EU team. <laughs> <laughs> and now, it's a Brazilian team playing against a European squad. A very abnormal first half of this map with very quick action from both teams, but it's slowed down an awful lot. And W7M controlling the pace through the second half. They find themselves on the wrong side of a 6-5 at the moment. Yeah, when things start getting closer in these rounds, matching more and more, of course, match point, or in some cases, overtime, teams tend to slow down, a bit more stress in the server, all of a sudden your small mistakes will have massive consequences on the outcome of the round, because if you mess up now as W7M, you lose this map 7-5. Of course, we know Mowgli lost to advance throughout, and they've done this trick now, but he gets spotted out. That's gonna shut down the surprise, but Deadshot is there again with the cover. The supportive work from the French team of Wolves is really paying off. See what they can do now. Might just go for a drop. They got the flashbangs. And they, yeah, it's gonna send it. And it, Wolves are ready for it. Almost another from Shinka in this spot, playing Ella Deadshot on the board as well. W7M left to just herds and fell apart. As KZ, it will not be a factor. He's been the raid boss for this W7M team. But again, this bag of tricks. They've got a lot of tools at their disposal. Rotate out of Attic. And now, ooh, maybe pressure from the other side of the map as Felipox is in, he'll soften up P4. Fast approaching Shinka, but you know how that Scorpion is at close range. It's all on the shoulders of Herds, who knows where they are, and the three remaining players from Wolves will coalesce around the front door. Around split, some might call it flag. As for Herds, he's in a tough spot at the moment. A single bullet will be his undoing. Now, Deadshot and P4 are low HP too, but a Herculean task could separate W7M from going down 0-1. As now Herds on the wrong side of the clock and P4 makes it official. Yeah. Wolves, 7-5 on their own map and frustration 
on the face of herds, I think for good reason. A really, really raucous start to this map. But it's Wolves to persevere and an impression, impressive fashion. They will go to W7M's map pick of Chalet up one nothing. Yeah, and I think this was definitely necessary for Wolves. If you want to win this series and have a chance for this, you got to win out in Oregon because it's not going to get any easier in Chalet or Clubhouse if we need to go there, but it's still yet an impressive showcase. Either way, both teams looked mighty good despite the scoreline. W7M have work to do on their own map. They'll go to a break, and so will we. We'll be right back.
And there it is, map one, Oregon is complete, and it's an EU victory. Wolves, the French squad, will take the map. A close one, I have to say, but at the same time, defender-sided meta, who? Because that looked like an actual normal game that we used to watch pre-nade meta nerfs. I guess, Fabian. I don't know if it would look like a normal game because I think Wolves took a very calculated gamble here. They played extremely aggressive those first three attack rounds that they had, only to slow down their tempo, play really slow for round four and five, and then again on round six, they sped it up and they basically just ran over W7M in their attacks. Then, yeah, they should have had a four to half even if you ask me. They made some mistakes, but honestly, that half is as good as it gets for Wolves. There was quite an interesting stat about Wolves coming into this, this, this match. Um, across the tournament, their differential between their attack and defense was phenomenal. It was 30, I, I don't know the exact, it was 30 something percent on the attack, I think 33 percent and 80 percent on the defense win rate. So they're clearly attacking was an issue. They came into this, like you say, with that calculated risk of just going, do you know what? We are going to go and we are going to try and bring that pace on the attacks. We know that either we are going to wipe the floor of W7M or it's going to look horrible. But ideally, if we can get a 3-3 split, they should have had a 4-2 split, by the way. We will set ourselves up nicely when we get onto the defense. And that's basically what exa exactly what they did. It kept them in the game. We said anything above two rounds or yeah. add two rounds, Absolutely. they're fine. We, we were clapping three, when they got to two rounds. Had green room. Yeah, that, that it was an incredible half from Wolves, I think. It's very well played. And you'll see some highlights here from num round number seven, Fabian. Well, oh, actually, we'll get to that in just a moment. It's just, gener just generic stuff. But honestly, even the generic B-roll from this map was pretty incredible because like you said, Wolves were just active. I've never seen them so fired up. It's such a nail biter. Like the rounds were so close. The gunfights went both ways. Overall, the game was super exciting to watch yeah. because you never knew which way it would turn out. It was really nice to actually see a game of really high quality siege. Like Wolves had a very specific game plan on their attack um, and they knew they could go into the defense as we said, but also there was a bit of jeopardy. There was a couple of clutches. This round here, they obviously should have won as well. And then we get going into the defenses where they managed to see it out. Obviously defense is very strong. I think when we saw W7M attack, they were much slower. They were as teams have been attacking at this tournament. They were kind of, they were falling down to some of the defensive power operators, as we spoke about in the pre-show, that were available. We'll talk about the evolution of Wolves and actually how close this game was in round number seven that I mentioned earlier. Let's put up on the screen, Fabian. Maybe you can help us out figure what was going on. Pay close attention to this because we're looking at both sides. W7M have freezer control, laundry control, and they're trying to clear out Bebo here on the laundry machine in the corner with Capital Bolts. And if we're looking at the attack, it's quite uncommon of an attack to go with Osa for a laundry side take. So it's, we're looking at two teams that have have reinvented the meta and this attack I'm super impressed by. Yeah, it was a really nice attack. It was a really nice idea. The one thing that we've basically been saying about Wolves is when they get that coordination and team play right, they are exceptional at it. And that's exactly what they did. W7M put up an attack that was really ingenuitive. It was really kind of not expected. It's not necessarily something that could be scripted. Wolves read into it and then 3 2 one back onto that attack. That's what won them around. And as well, in a 7 5 victory, so close, such marginal things can take you to a win or an overtime. That adaptation is something we did not used to see from Wolves. So, I mean, before SI that is, it seems like a lot has changed, but I'm wondering, has something changed in your minds as an ex-professional player from, you know, what happened in the group stage last week and their gameplay today? I don't think we should look down on W7M for this performance at all. I think we should praise Wolves for what they did because Absolutely. they massively stepped up the gameplay. So I think we have two very strong teams here that are fighting for, well, next map. And it could go either way this one as well. I'm expecting wonders. And I think this is going to be one of the best games yeah. in the tournament. We talk about, you know, both teams, but it seems like on W7M, at least on the scoreboard, which doesn't tell the whole story, there was one player that stood above the rest, Jack. Yeah, Casey. he's going to be absolutely fuming. He's going to be absolutely fuming that he's dropped such big numbers and massively high EPS. Like you can see, massive entry. He's had a huge impact onto this game and been on the losing side of it. As an individual player, he did not deserve to lose. I think W7M as a team were not as good as Wolves on Oregon and kind of rightfully lost. But individually, he had such big impacts and it's the multi-kills in the rounds. He was able to bring them back into it. Even this very first round, Wolves has kind of brought the rush. I know that W7M lost to the clutch, but he, Casey brought it right back into W7M to be able to actually win it. It's one of those games that just happens, you know? The rest of the team were a little bit on the well. Did you ever uh, I actually had the kill record in this game for a while, oh. and back in like year one, 
I, that was a while ago. It's when you played two, you won a game at five rounds. Yeah. That's a stone age. Makes it more impressive in some way. Yeah, some, somehow 17 kills, you look, in what, nine rounds? That's pretty impressive. Can't complain about that. 22 here with, with this sort of domination and, and lost. And it seems like the rest of the team, I mean, they're trying their best, but here, when you have a teammate that's just taking all the kills, it's something else. It feels like without KZ on the lineup, especially in the last, last round when he got taken out, that Wolves would have had an even better time adapting. Yeah, but this has always been the beauty of W7. Them. In this instance, they lost. They lost the map, right? Mm -hmm. Despite the fact he's dropped such big numbers. However, when W7M have got strategy somewhat wrong before, they've had players and they have players across all five that can step up. If it's not KZ, it's Herds. If it's not Herds, it's JV. If it's not JV, it's Philippe Box. If it's not Philippe Box, it's. You know, any of them can step up. You have five of the best players in the world. Yeah. There's no two ways around it. But how do the five best team, well, I guess with G2 uh, out of the picture, at least for this game, the top five players in the world that are trying their best to get back into this game. Map number two will be coming up in a bit. That is Chalet, that is W7M's pick. How do you refocus after this near loss, Fabian? They're an experienced enough team to just come back from this. It happens. People have... Well, I'm gonna say it, shit maps. They do play poorly sometimes, and it just happens. Accept it, move on, and push through. Again, I'll come back to back in the old days. Peng had a, like a zero kill map against Font, only to go up and drop, I don't even remember. You had the- I cast, casted that. You casted that game. You he didn't even believe that he was gonna do it. No, I, of course I didn't believe in him. He is not a good player. Okay, he was a good player. <laughs> but he came back from zero kills to drop almost 20. Anyone can have those days. Your team believes in you. Everybody around you believes in you they will probably turn this around. So what do you do to change from Oregon to Chalet? How does it play out differently for W7? You forget about Oregon. Oregon was the other team's map pick. And I think the one thing that you tell yourself as a player, even if it's not true, is that in a best of three, you win your map pick, the opponent wins their map pick, and you actually battle it out on the decider. So these W7M guys, they will have forgotten about Oregon already. On to Chalet. What is Chalet? It's literally the highest preference map. They'll take any team in the world onto Chalet. They feel comfortable on that map. Don't forget it was Wolf's picks. That last map was Wolf's pick. Yeah, sure. exactly. This is where W7M wants to so, play, and Clubhouse just as much. So in this case, are we still expecting a reversal of the meta where like we actually see attackers playing properly and taking, you know, those four two halves, especially on Chalet that a year ago was like the top one in attacker meta. One thing that Wolves have always been good at, even when they were struggling, was their pre-planned decision making. Like yeah. Their pre-plans where we go here, we push together here and we just go for it. They were a little bit worse on adaptations and Chalet is one of those maps where pre-planned ideas work really well. Yes. Are you expecting to Barao? Yes. I, I think so on Chalet. I think the Fenrir ban particularly will probably come in. That that map is like so prime to attackers being able to find the opportunities through various windows, through various staircases. I think two bar will be left open, Fenrir probably banned. And you think Wolves can play into this because they're starting off on the attacking side here. Is this something where they can gather that early game momentum as they did on Oregon and maybe keep it rolling for a second half? I, I, I think they will pin ban Fenrir themselves just so that they uh -huh. can have this pre-planned rushes. It's if what, it, sorry, sorry to interrupt, it's what enabled them on Oregon with those pre-planned exactly. fast plays. And if you guys have ever watched Wolves play Chalet before, you'll know they like to jump in on all the windows at the same time and go as a group. All five explode in three seconds and each just chaos erupts. How do you slow it down as W7M? Because we used to, e even in the group stage, the big conversation was Wolves have learned how to slow the game down when they're on defense and just play to their advantage. It's what they did against SSG. is what they kept going on through the rest of the groups. I just think they need to use more power operators when, they're on, when they were on defense. We didn't see so much as army out of them inside of that defense. It was a lot of good guns rather than the utility. So we're looking for map three? Yeah, I think so. With some Legion and Frost on the windows, I think they can slow down Wolves. I think Wolves have to get it done in two. I think if we go to Clubhouse, it could be a reverse sweep. Absolutely. Well then, Fresh Fabian, thank you very much. We are ready. I hope you are at home. We got Taro and Pengu on the other side. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Gaston, and thank you so much to the rest of the desk. I'll ask you your prediction. What do you think Chalet is going to turn out to be? I am very glad for Wolves that they start defense because I think they'll get shut down on the attacking side, but by starting defense, they can build up those rounds and get things done. So are you expecting a 2-0? I, expecting... I, I, honestly, I'm going to be a Wolves believer. They were in a clubhouse? I, I think they take a 2-0, but like we're talking 7-5 or overtime here in Chalet. And just because they're starting defense, because the way W7M, they play Chalet, they've been changing the meta when they first came to the scene. They make it very hard to enter the building with long lines of sight and utility set up. I don't think Wolves can play the way they did on Oregon here on Chalet. So I think if you're Wolves, you built up those like three, four defensive round victories, you win a couple of nice clean or clutch attacks, and then you settle a deal there. That's what I'm hoping for them. But again, might not be true. 
Operator bands rolling in a Nomad band mm. yet again. Okay. Band out alongside Ying. Will we see the same thing here? Yes. Okay, we gotta keep our eyes peeled though, like they just spoke about the Fenrir band, because oh, this will peel all opened up, you know? Because this will enable the attack inside tremendously. Or of course, Solus can shut down all those drones. That makes Intel gathering hard. You gotta worry more about the verticality of the map. So that's also a great band here coming out from the side of W7M. And Fenrir actually, to everybody's surprise, I would say, is being left open, of course. If you're well starting on defense, maybe you want to utilize this particular operator to build up those rounds like we mentioned. So Miram, Solus, Ying, Nomad, not in play here for Chalet. Nothing too out of the ordinary, but you are going to have both a Sami and the Fender open, and that those pick rates are some of the highest in the league. I'd like to remind everybody that while we are on the A stream, the B stream is also in action. It is the an all Brazilian showing. Three of the, what, five Brazilian teams who are here at this event are currently competing in the first match of the day. FaZe Clan versus Lowe's is being done by Stokes and Lynx on the other stream. If you want to go in and see what's going on over there. Spoilers inbound for those of you that are, have not been watching it. Face Clan took that break. Okay. okay. That's not too surprising. An Atlanta rematch, by the way, for those that watched Atlanta as well, where FaZe were not as fortunate as they did not really win out in that series. So it's a nice little rematch in that scenario. However, here on Shalane, things will have a very interesting start because we see a Glass, we see a Manti, we see Thatcher, Thermite, and the Ace. So from the attack inside here, this could be a, you know, Thatcher, Thermite, go to the backside, open up to get, you know, get, get the split, um, split pressure, rather. And then whenever you want to execute on the main side, you have Manti, Glass, and Thermite who can really open things up. Shinka's on the Warden, that's going to be the biggest direct counter, but there's only one C4 from Deadshot who's currently roaming, and there's no smokes available. This could be a very simplified attacking round because of him, they saw the operators in the drone phase. <laughs> Nade was, uh, Nade was peeking connector with his pistol out. <laughs> On the Monty, not usually how it works. Like maybe they don't want to give the Monty Tied way the just yet. Smokes will go off onto the main main doorway, by the way, main breach. Now Nate is getting the plant off. Look at Felipox. We are one minute into action. And they'll pull it off. Nate dies in the fight that occurs, but it allows Felipox to get out of there. JV92 dies. Wolves have an oh. answer so far to this setup from W7M. You just have to get onto that diffuser right away. Defenders have they don't know exactly where the three remaining players are. The Brazilian team is now Herds walks in. We'll take advantage of this, catch them with their pants down. Fibu not quick enough to turn around. The Herds will follow up as now Felipox on the board. Oh, Wolves answer back. Felipox getting closer and closer. It's all gonna come down to Shinka who stops him. Masterfully defended by Wolves. Round one goes to the defense. The French squad rebuffing the Brazilians. That round right there could have a tremendous amount of impact later on in this series. That is one of those rounds where W7M, they had the perfect read, the perfect attacker repick, and I would say they had thought of every single position that they had when that plant went down. It was so free. So how do they lose it? Well, the retake is instantaneous from the side of Oz. More importantly, they kill the Monty right before it gets a shield back for the extension. So we see it here. Bomb goes down. Less than half a second later, Shinka finds the kill. That means Monty cannot extend, stay alive. We see P4. He swings out on the back side of things. Again, the retake from every single angle. Sprinting up staircases, jumping out of windows, finding kills. Not allowing W7M to set up for a strong post plan position, playing far outside the building it's again just like the desk said when the walls they play together on all the fundamentals but confidence and communication is flowing they seem to be unstoppable even up against the back-to-back -back major champions of w7m Five seconds to go. wolves have woken up and chosen violence today is attackers are heading out we saw back field. on oregon and now as it continues on on chalet w7m will bring a different lineup quite a different lineup in fact for Kitchen, almost every single operator is different. Gridlock has been seeing a heightened amount of play compared to previous seasons and previous events. 
you think there's something about the changes that have necessitated gridlock on these maps? I mean, gridlock does have a nice bit of utility, right? Like, Nomad's been banned, so that's, of course, one reason. That might be your primary preference here. But as a secondary flank watch operator, you get soft destruction, you get soft reach in a secondary shotgun. The gun is phenom phenomenal, especially on LAN. Um, you can cover the sound with the gadget, of course, cover the flanks, show slow down defenders in certain locations on the map. So overall, I think, just like Buck, for example, Gridlock is a very flexible operator, but it does require a little bit of creativity to use to its full potential. WCVM, they have creativity. They know how to implement these things from KC. Already used one nade, already had the shotgun for window the window earlier on. And once you get top block control, if Ram from JV can't get the entire job done, KC and Hertz and Buck and Gridlock can help assist further with the vertical destruction. And with how quick this boy is disappearing, this might be a tough one here for Wolves. See the destruction brought from the operator of Ram, who Reload! is very site dependent, as we see from an operator like Castle, who's also been brought. You could, in theory, bring a Castle on every single bomb site. Yeah, you could on every single map. But Castle will have a greater amount of impact depending on the way the site works. Same with Ram. If you are attacking a map that doesn't have a lot of vertical play, if you are attacking a map where defenders extend very far outwards, if you're attacking a map that doesn't have soft floors, for example, look at Clubhouse. Mm. Ram really doesn't make sense on most of Clubhouse, if yeah. any site at all. So you look at something like Chalet, it makes a big difference. Another rush is going to come in from W7N. They've already taken Mowgli off. One minute to go as Nade just creeps into the bomb site, establishes the shield, and almost gets the diffuser down. Taking some damage in the process. The guns from Wolves hitting their marks, but W7M are so clean and so proficient. Sweeping all the way through, Bibu gets one kill, a down as well, but that's all he can muster. W7M answer back. And again, strategically a very sound round from W7M. I love these out of nowhere OSA plans that it's hard to prepare against. I mean, I bet you they've looked at Wolves and how they've been playing because there's one thing that is leading to the OSA plans, a lack of impact grenades on defense. Even C4 is only one or two in these rounds, but they're on the roaming side of the map, so they can't shut down the plants. Osa is a little bit quicker than Monty. You get a good gun, you get two attempts. Right? You walk in, you put down that shield, you got a spare in pocket if anything happens. I really like this innovation on both Chalet, previously on Oregon, where the attackers are happy to try new things despite this being at the sixth invitation. I mean, it's the best time for it. Catching your opponent by surprise. The only person with impacts in that round left in pocket was dead shot on Asami. Where was he? Top floor, piano hallway, trying to retake the verticality. And that just means that the bomb will go down behind the Oza shield. There's no denying it. It was close, but it would have gone down regardless. Once it's put in the ground, the cover is perfect. And Wolves could be very happy they won the first round retake because it would have been a 2-0 otherwise. No, absolutely. Wolves looking a little bit less pronounced in that round than what we saw from before, but both times W7M had a really good idea of what they wanted to do. Yeah. So round number one. Oh. That's a gamble and a half. It is actually exactly what we saw happen on Oregon, but it was the Azami that died early, if I recall. I think that was Mowgli, who was killed by KZ on a spawn peek over towards Armory. So I will say, I actually believe that the bar bombsite favors the most of anything, maybe tied with basement, when it comes to like a 5v5 executes. It's a bombsite where attackers have to work very hard to gain the ground that matters. You know, top blue stairs, mezzanine, library, etc. So going for an aggressive bomb peak on a bomb site that is arguably really good for defenders, I'm not a big fan of. I rather would have seen a spawn peak like that last round where it gets punished because it's kitchen dining. Fellows fell apart really quickly. They didn't have the top floor control. Because now I feel like those put themselves on the back to the over necessarily aggression. But P4 ends us back with a C4. That's you know, the box of destruction removed from action. But this could have been a five versus four scenario with Deadshot live on the Warden. Instead, it's a one-for-one -one trade, nullifying things more than anything else, and W7M still in a prime position to go for an attack around here. So I'm not sure in the exact style here for Wolves. They maybe had a bit of a misread, but I do love that people now is on the Fenrir, utilizing that operator and the gadget because it was spent out on Oregon and we didn't see play in the first two rounds. Barrier found. Keeper deployed. Hmm, this is a... Uh... Heavy, heavy investment, by the way, upstairs in library. Three players from Wolves, all within arm's reach of each other over top of this bomb site. P4 is in the bomb site down below. 
really have their I mean, horses stretched all that far out. I mean, you might be wondering, oh, there's only four of them. Well, yeah, that's because Deadshot died early. Yeah, but it's funny. Imagine they had one more player, right, to play blue stairs, to play missing. They have a shield there. Mm -hmm. They got Keeper Bearers, but they've given up the entire control, only playing inside the library. It's a different take for this defense, but it works. Nitro still tossed out by Shinka, catches JV92. Slow round, one minute left. W7M were very quick to the punch in rounds one and two. They've been Ooh. sluggish this time. They've made it no. He's hiding. How do they not know he's up here? There's no way. There is no way. They dropped. W7M, they hear the drop sound. They think it's clear, and they don't drone because, again, they think they know for a fact that this is clear, but it's not. Be with a big flank here. It's just, you have to wait. Figure out exactly when you can be the most impactful. KZ dies off-site to Mog. Now it's Fella Fox getting ever closer to the bomb site. Nade too not far away. Bibu, for all we know, still just sitting inside a library. Down goes Nade to Mowgli. And outside of losing Deadshot early, Wolves don't suffer another casualty. Not bad, not bad at all. Wolves regain the lead. One of the best and yet worst feelings that you can have strategically is when you make the right play, you know, baiting for people, impacting the floor for the drone deny, etc. But then they don't really go into library. People's flank doesn't even happen. It's Mogul instead who flanked early in the round, who gets the kill into fireplace. So people's like, guys, I did it. The plan worked, but it wasn't really rewarded. Now the good side is because WCM never saw that people actually hid inside the library the entire time, they might very well do this the next time they play the same bomb side, and it will be another surprise factor towards the attack inside. We saw here the Valkyrie effect in play, the yellow pings coming out. W7M not playing the IQ like they did on Oregon to find those cameras rock, to rock. stop themselves from dying to fall from down go. below, and that's one of the difficulties. Oh, Fabian oh, spoke on desk about how Chalet is a map that heavily plays into the pre-plans. What you have theorized beforehand, where you say, we have the strategy, we're gonna execute it. And the issue is, if you're W7M, or any team for that matter on attack, and you have this specific plan, you need these specific operators, but they're playing Valkyrie. All of a sudden, it's like, okay, either we don't have the IQ to counter, and those cameras will be an issue, or you go off your pre-structured plan and weaken yourself strategically just to play the counter game. And it's why it's so important, I think, that you don't stack it on defense, playing the same five defenders every single round, because by playing the same five, let's say, strongest defenders, while they are the strongest, it's predictable. You're not forcing the attacker VPX to do problem solving and thinking, but one thing will stay the same, that shot will fall first again, again, and again. Deadshot has been such an intriguing player on this team because he's had some good looks, but more often than not, it seems like he plays, I don't want to say carelessly, but he mm. plays a little bit too upfront. It ends up hurting him, and I think it can sometimes hurt the team as well. But another round advantage for, M for W7M. Three rounds in a row of uncontested first bloods charitably. You could say that it was a trade back in round number one. Yeah, the first kill came out, and then right after was when the diffuser got down, and there were some kills to answer back, etc. But W7M striking first is obviously excellent. They haven't been able to capitalize just yet. And if Deadshot wants to play this way, which he can by all means, why not give him the Jaeger? Put down the ADSs, put down the blue of camera, and you're just a free roaming gun. What was a good yellow ping onto Mowgli, but perhaps it wasn't in that case, gets punished with a great flick, but the chaos ensues in the server. And W7, they're going in everywhere, jumping in windows, but mostly getting shut down. It's a 3v2, still favoring the attack. JV92 dies on main stairs. Pibu far enough back. Now playing by that snowmobile garage door that has been opened up. That's very unlike WCVM. I mean, they really wanted people there, but you're playing 3v2 on basement attack, main bridge opened up. You don't need to go for the aggressive play there to try and take down people. Instead, JV will lose his life, only do a bit of damage, and it's now 2v2, which favors defense all of a sudden. They got the bombs out in control. Good news though, Nate and Casey with flashes and nades, they have utility to work with. With Beeble on HP, they're in a decent position. Shinke has three toxic babes on the smoke. You'll have to use them to deny one of the two player positions to help isolate those gunfights to favor Wolves. Hit the barbed wire now, give his position away. Nate holds on to that diffuser, Shinke can smoke it. Still two remaining with 45 seconds left, which means there might be a window of opportunity to creep down. But I also have to imagine that Shinka will keep one in back pocket to throw towards the default plant spot. All the while, KZ has coverage over towards the breach. Grenade will go out, but it sails the wrong way. Bibu almost dead. Now KZ walking in. Nade breathing in tons of gas. It's all up to Shinka to clutch out, who's now just wasting time. 
Nothing's exactly where the Finca is, but he is in a rough spot. Oh. Finished off by none other than KZ. And we've got ourselves a tie game. Again, no matter what, these teams so evenly matched. Bit of a gap there being left from Moles, both watching the same angle. And this is where communication is really important. Maybe if one of the dead players like Bebo, for example, can spectate both players and say, guys, you're holding the same thing. The person before, or Shinka, sorry, inside the blue door can only watch the main breach walking and the main staircase. He cannot watch, um, cannot really watch anything else, just the blue, blue staircase flank. Whereas the person prone the floor, he's watching the same exact thing. So connector is left a little bit open. They sneak in successfully by nading off the blue door. And there's just that small gap being taken advantage of. I was thinking that Wolves was gonna win that round. And I was gonna say JV dying early meant that there was no backstab flank from the trench side with nobody from Wolves watching it. But that didn't really matter because the utility game, the few flashbangs and the few grenades, they got the job done. And there'll be a technical timeout even though we're only four rounds in. Yeah, Lilian obviously not seeing stuff that she likes. I wonder how much of it honestly does fall down to Deadshot. He's been a non-factor yeah. in almost every single round so far. And not even that he's been a non-factor. The last two rounds, I think you would downright say he was a liability. Now, mind you, when you go for a spawn peak, as he did two rounds prior, you know that you do so under the understanding of things potentially going bad for your team, and that's the case, right? The rest of the Wolves have to play a 4v5, and they do end up coming out ahead. They won the rest of the round very handedly. Remember, I think Deadshot was the only casualty in that round, but I don't know if you can point your finger at him here. There were structural issues with the roam for Wolves, yeah. and again, a coach can see what's going on, call that timeout, even though we might think it's early to try and ensure that things don't go even worse for you. I'm actually a big fan of early timeouts because it gives you more time to work on the problems and I think get ahead of them because right now it's 2-2. Two -two. It's not the end of the world for either side, but if Wolves, they have things that they gotta, they gotta fix and that they didn't like, play the way they prepared for, then I think getting ahead of that problem now, get the next two defensive rounds, then go on attack, that's all great. I'm a big fan of that, to be honest. The big question mark just comes down to will there be a strategical change-up? Because often at this Invitationals, when we've seen tactical timeouts that I've cast at least, it's usually been very different operators going from fast to slow or vice versa, like a big strategical change. Deathshot is off the Asami on a more, let's say, restrained operator of castle, where you gotta make your rotate, set up the castle barricades, and often play for a specific part of the map that you gotta hold on to as an anchor player more so. And P4, who's been, you know, phenomenal player in Orc and great so far in Chalet, he gets to play a more active role with the three keeper barriers right now, two impacts in pocket, with the deny, for example, and Osa, if that would be the play here. So I do like this change up in Wolves after the tactical timeout. W7M have used the first minute. Their drones in play, losing roughly half of them, but gaining a good understanding of this Wolves defense, which stretches all the way upstairs from the bomb site on the main floor. Both of these positions will be given away by the Zofia, and that is just, that is a head scratcher. Two quick kills from W7M answered back by Bebu, but that's all Wolves can muster as Deadshot is in a really rough spot. Just having a little bit of a cheeky bath and there looked to be a Flores drone going in after him. In the jacuzzi, still being flashed. Oh it's my. a blood bath as Felipox finishes him off. Bibu, oh. still so phenomenal from above. Three kills as he now drops. But the job is done for him upstairs. I mean, that turns the tide. Again, Wolves, they don't strategically make the right play necessarily, but they got that backup plan and say, okay, let's play for the crosses. Deadshot burns so much utility and so much time inside the bathtub. It was a worthy death, if you will, especially compared to just getting spawn beat in the previous two rounds. Now it's down to another 2v2 where communication and teamwork will triumph anything else. Sure, you can hit a nice shot, but playing together for those crossfires, getting those trades in, that's gonna be your primary way to win these rounds. They've still got drones to work with. It's W7M have 30 seconds left to pull off and execute. Two smokes on the crossbow of Nades Capital. So at least you'll have some of the ability to obscure. The Wolves just need to sit and wait, and they know the advance is going to come from over towards Trophy. Shinka may be a little bit too forward. Nade down, secured by Shinka. Bibu at every kill so far through this round for his team. 
but you've got an insurance policy. Five Bibu giving remain. himself away for a moment. KZ hoping Ooh. for a pick, doing some serious damage, but Shingo will survive. Three players ultimately live through that round and after the timeout, Wolves regain the lead. Bibu, the hero in that one. It was P4 and Orc and time and time again. I haven't said Bibu's name much today, but historically he has been the player for this team to often really step up when it comes to saying, guys, let's run through this doorway. I'm going to lead the charge. He leads by example. And when they need to step up and clutch, he will do that too. Deadshot, as I said, burns so much utility despite dying inside the bathroom, only having like 20 HP left to his name. It was a worthy death for him and his team. But the big issue here for the attack inside, no vertical play in the round. That means all the playable positions on the bottom side are fortified. Usually, you cannot play Westman like they did. You cannot play Kitchen Dining like they did because the floor above them should be torn to pieces giving the attackers lines of sight to deny those playable positions. But because there was no buck in play, because Sophia died early in that round, all the floor was intact. That means that you can play anywhere. It's gonna be a big guessing game, entering down the staircase, like we saw from W7M, and the cross from Wolves, it was established. Now we'll see a clash instead, though. So things are gonna really shift up here. We're gonna see no two bro. We were all wrong on that, because I too was kind of feeling that here in Chalet. But a kite in the clash certainly speaks towards utility and slowing down the pace of this round. I can't remember who I was talking to uh, at the time, but now that you and I are together, I can reference this and see what your thoughts are. Okay. I was led to believe that there would be far more Tuberau yeah. based on what I'd heard from scrim reports. Yeah. Right? I thought this operator was going to be absolutely dominating the meta, and obviously that has not come to pass. Azami and Solus have seen their pick rates obviously through the roof, and there's not a surprise either. No Azami present from Wolves on this last defense, even though she is available. Obviously, Solus being banned now is going to require a change for these teams, especially with the way that you roam. If you want to roam down below or above, you have so much value from that gadget. But yeah, a bit surprised that Tubrow hasn't been anywhere near as prominent as I thought. No, I, I feel you. And I, I did see being played out by some teams here at the event, like GK, for example. But in half the hours that Tubrow was played that I saw, the impact from the operator wasn't really there. Tuber would die with like canisters in the pocket or use them like too late or maybe they wouldn't trick off them. So I too have been very surprised at the lack of presence. But this also speaks to why go to new stuff that's hard to learn and deal with when you get the good old Asami, Fenrir, etc. But hold on a second. Casey jumps in the window and actually is shaken in the gunfight, losing out against Mowgli. And Deadshot finds another as well. So WCM on the back foot here. Wolves, they want the 4 2 half. Absolutely. And I mean, it's shaping up well, fella pox doing his best to try to keep things close. I feel a little bit badly because I kind of unfairly pointed my finger at both Felipox and Nade as not star players from W7M in comparison to the other three. And now Felipox is eating everybody's lunch except for KZ. Mm. Playing high value operators while also getting picks. Greater problem than I see for W7M and the fact that they're in a 3v4 is that they have to deal with a clash. Yes. And they have nothing to deal with her. You have flashes, but that's about it. It's not going to help you close the gap. She's going to be able to slow you down. And unless you just simply outposition her, mm. she's going to have huge value later in this round. I think the key here is that you put a gun behind her, kind of like Monty on attack, could be Beagle and Warden, for example, where P4 can escort someone into a gunfight or go for a retake, and you leverage the fact that you have the shield in front of you that doesn't care about gunplay, which is all the attackers have, as you mentioned. So P4 here could really get a lot of value for his team, if not with Intel, but by taking map ground back on the retake. All three remaining players from W7M in a similar enough position. This is a nice cross that's being held as the diffuser should go down successfully. Wolves surely yeah, must know this, but they let it happen under their noses anyway. Mowgli the on the flank. Down. Now as the clash comes into action, and guess what? No. You're getting calls. No. Mowgli is there to capitalize on oh, both of them. Masterfully played. And it's P4 to let it happen as both of the kills happen under his watch and graciously lets Mowgli secure 4-2 first half for Wolves. I was going to say Wolves, they absolutely trolled the 4v3. They gave them bombsite, they gave them the plan, they gave up so much unnecessary space that was theirs, but they have this mindset that we don't see that often in Siege, where you will play for the retake. Usually, when Diffuser goes down in Siege, it's like an 85% attacker win rate in the post plant. 
We don't see retakes like this happen, but the Clash opened things up. And what better way to catch your opponents by surprise, the back-to-back -back major champions, than to show them a strategy and an operator that has probably never been seen this way before, one-to-one. -one. You can't prep for this. You gotta problem solve on the fly, in the server, and they start chasing down the Clash inside a bar, and they get caught with their pants down, getting shot from fireplace stairs, fireplace itself, because Mowgli and Beeple reacted off that play. There... I mean... Appears to be a tech issue. Fabian and, uh, and Mr. Freshy Boy, they said that JV told them right before they sat down, they want to make the lower bracket run here. Maybe take some of that G2 magic from last year, where you have like a pretty shaky group, pretty shaky, you know, second phase of the, of the Invitationals, but then lower bracket miracle run against all odds is a great storyline. I don't think putting yourself there intentionally is a good idea though, nor do I think they're doing it. But this is not the WCN that we came to expect, but also big praise to Wolves. This is a team that I kind of took off my paper and said, I don't think they're gonna go far. Looking at previous records, looking at the fact they played some tier two events in Europe and really struggled. Like they won, but it was like overtime. It was like seven, five, not clean victories. But this is a different Wolves here in the server today and at this event so far. And I am honestly very impressed with some of these rounds. No, I honestly, the, the way Wolves have shown up is playing up to the potential that we think this team has, right? The yeah. main conversation that tends to happen around this French squad at every single event, Nick, is... She sounds so goofy <laughs> when you slow it down. But the main conversation that tends to happen... <laughs> Can we go even slower? Alright, let's cool it down. Let's, Five seconds to go. let's chill a little bit here. Let's relax. Let's maybe just chill a little bit. Nah, the main, the main conversation that tends to happen around Wolves is about not living up to their potential, Exactly. Right? This is a team that is consistently making top eight. Yep. This is a team that is consistently proving that they are one of the best teams in the world and one of the best teams from Europe. But they are always, they're always at the wedding. They're not even the bridesmaid. They're just <laughs> at the wedding, watching the bride, the bridesmaid, and all the wedding party while they sit in the audience. They can absolutely be a team that wins events. Yeah. But it relies on a lot of factors. And in this instance, it just, it, it seems like they are now playing the way that they want, and they are looking very sharp. W7M are not playing poorly a, at, any, at, any, at any step of this matchup. It, it's just that Wolves are beating them, beating them on defense, beating them on attack. Now Wolves have, inarguably, the harder side on this map. They have yeah. to go to attack. If they can get an early round, oh, I no. think this will put well. And it's going to be a rush, by the way. Down goes Herd. Down goes Nade. What? Down goes KZ. P4. Really? Now looking for more above. JV92 and Fellabox have lost all their teammates. I don't understand. P4 didn't even care about the flashbang. This might be a flawless thing to start things off here for Wolves. They have so much confidence. Somebody shut them down. The only one to die so far is Mowgli. Now JV92 will unsheath the sidearm. Smart glasses as well, working in his favor. But so many bullets being tossed his way. Wolves, two rounds away from a 2-0 over the defending major champs. This is mental warfare in the server at its finest. You go on your first attack around, it's gonna be difficult, it's gonna be complicated. You walk in basement staircase as P4, you walk up Bruce staircase, you get team flashed, you get shot at, you don't even look at who shot at you because you know it is not your job to deal with that player inside a fireplace or dining hallway. That is the fireplace double door, double door player's position to take care of, and they did it. Perfectly played. Wolves, they have these kind of rush strats on various maps. Clubhouse, gym attack through the breach is like the most iconic one from them, I would say. And they're so excellent at understanding the timings of each other to execute together. I predicted in a set that if, w if uh, Wolves rather, she would win this map, they gotta go three or four defensive rounds and build things up. Because it's very difficult to problem solve the attacker rounds the way that WCM they defend on Shelly. Not only did they get the four maps of defense, they got their first attack on bar as well. They have put themselves in the absolute best position to take this series 2-0 and they are only two rounds away.
I mean, what more can be said than what the Wolves play is saying already? Yeah, yeah, right? I have been... I have been so impressed with this team. <laughs> of course, with Fenrir in play, we expected a near 100% pick rate from W7M possibly. And the way the Wolves played that very first round, you wish you had two Fenrir operators on your lineup because there is just no area that seems to be safe. And oh boy, the attacker repick. Green is giving me some really good vibes here. You can still change with three seconds left, but now it'll be locked in. Dokipi, Lion, Glass, and Blitz. A bomb has been located. The benefit of being up 4-2, you can have some funny rounds. Because as an IGL, as a leader like Beeple, you can now just say, guys, let's try this, yeah. right? Because if you lose this, it's only 5-3. It's not the end of the world. So the creative freedom here and the confidence boost is even bigger now for Wolves. Now, there is one downside. Uh, the wall is soft, I believe. It looks no, like it. it. It unless there's a glitch. No, I think it might just be soft. So that means, okay, I thought they were going to shoot the thermos, but no. So now they can, okay, I thought it might get shot. Now they can go for rush. The wall between sides is reinforced. There is no mirror window. Nobody close to side has any kind of deny. It's JV and Fenrir. This rush, it looks very free from my point of view. And there go the smokes. They're just off to the it's races. So free. It's so free. W7M need to get back to the site. They win with oh. one single nitro cell. Nade is dropped. JV92 is down as well. It might show that there's an advantage right now for W7M, but it's certainly not there as Wolves clean up. Now it's Mowgli to take some damage. Fellabox looking to come back. KZ getting on the board. Mowgli, another attempt to get the diffuser down. As Fellabox has worked his way up, but he gets flashed out and has to peel off. A post plant will ensue. As it's a 3v3, Blitz Abibu is still in play as well, Nick. So this could be humongous. But now he's gone to KZ, oh. who finds a triple. Deadshot needs to win the round for his team, but he shot through the wall. And this is W7M capitalizing so effectively. They'll be able to hop on that diffuser with plenty of time to go. A quad kill from KZ leads the way. He has over 31 kills so far through a map and a half. This is a hero game from him. But his team might still lose 2-0, and that is devastating. I like the strategy there, but what in the middle of that round broke down for Wolves that let W7M get back in the match? That's the thing, and I think Casey, as big of a strength as he is for his team, also the biggest weakness, because if he doesn't have these kinds of rounds and these kinds of performances, Wolves would just run away with the series, and it would already be over 2-0, counting for how Oregon played out, and now here in Chile. Wolves, I thought it was a phenomenal round from them where they had everything for completely for free. But the thing is, the C4 rotated it down right before the plant finished the first time around, and that stalled out the attack from Wolves. Then they pushed deep, they got the kills, and we saw it here, Mowgli and Bibu pushing aggressively together inside of blue, trying to regain the blue control despite having the bomb set itself. So Wolves don't want to play passive, you know, far out the building, going outside trench, and holding passive angles. They want to run at their opponent. And given the fact that Blitz, I don't blame him. It seemed like a good strategy on paper. The Flash was going to follow things up as well, but the cover was good from W7M. Wolves, they lose the round, but Reloading. they asserted dominance in the server, and they've now forced W7M to play this awkward game of, okay, if we're roaming too far off the bomb site, they're going to rush it. But if you play five guys on site, they're going to roam clear without any issues. So now the problem solving has to be on the defenders to play that fine line of we're on this side, we're kind of roaming, but we can spread ourselves out as thin and as aggressive, uh, aggressive as they would like to. This is still very winnable for W7M, by the way. It is. They got the favorable side. They persevered on one defense so far. They win three more. Suddenly we go to overtime. That means that Wolves only picks up a single round, but have to factor in but this is W7M's map, so there should be some familiarity here. Mind you, it's hard to beat the numbers if you expect teams to win four rounds on attack, or four rounds on defense, or five rounds on attack, or five rounds on defense, or map you're playing again. on. Oh, then you have the numbers working against you. Dead shot, though, by the way, gets maybe a bit too brazen as KZ picks up his dozenth kill. Felipox dies, so Wolves are at least hitting their marks with these shots. 
Shinko holds on to the diffuser, and he's not that far removed from the bomb site. Smokes will go off, and now amidst the plants, he will do literally a plant. No yellow ping. They have no idea. They're playing from above, though, Nick. And amidst the smoke, they think they have an idea. Shinka gets the plant down and just walks away. This is so free. It looked for a second there like wolves were going to open up the walls, which maybe is not the best idea because it gives your opponents an opportunity to fight back. Bibu on upside down repel. JV92 retaking from over towards Trophy. Herds with one kill. Oh. Shinka wins that gunfight. And Herds is the only one standing between wolves and match point. Gets back to the bomb site, takes out Shinka, but Bibu propels Wolves to series point. The mind game of, hey, we might rush the bomb site, don't roam too hard above. Well, it wasn't read by W7M. They, I, I think the mindset here is that they're thinking there is no way they will do the same quote-unquote stupid play again, rushing the side, risking it all. But again, Wolves, they love going for these kinds of plays. They had the intel. There was a Valkyrie being played from the defense, but no yellow pings coming through. Either they had no cam on side, or it was dealt with earlier by Wolves themselves. So they establish a plant. They get that single player on site, that opening kill. And while Deadshot did die unnecessarily peeking the hatch very early in the round, the rest of the team got the job done. Shinka here holding down the verticality, holding down the flank. It was beautifully played. And then Bibu actually rappled in up above to play the post plant. So if they lost side control, if Shinka had died, he's now on the master bedroom hatch and he can see the diffuser. So not only do they have step one, drone phase, that's done. They got all the intel they wanted. Step two, rush the bomb side and get the plant down. They also did that. If it came down to like a 1v1 or the people died on side after bomb was planted, they also had step three, post plant. People, sole responsibility was to cover the fuser in case things went south. All things were accounted for. Wolves are now on match point 6-3 in favor. And this could be the final round for them to send WSM to the lower bracket in a 2-0 fashion, beating every prediction and everyone who even might be Wolves fans, I don't think saw this coming. How do you fix this if you're W7M, Nick? Yeah, how do you fix it? I mean, if you're getting rushed like this, I would say play closer together. But then you're giving up the roam, then you lose map control. It is an awkward case of, I do believe here that there is just too much performance individually from Casey and not enough from the squad as a whole. It is a very top heavy performance so far. Yeah. Nade does not have a single kill so far through Chalet. He and Pelopox also had relatively poor stats. Now, JV92 with the first pick on to Deadshot. Mowgli answers right back, and again, Wolves are so quick in here. There's a Maestro close up, oh. starts firing away. Mowgli finds a second pick, but he's shut down by none other than KZ, who is still very much on the board. This is absurd. It is literally one man against the world right now. JV and Nate they fall. Sure, JV got the technical opening close the round, but Nate does nothing closet. It's not a trade from KC. It's him individually swinging out, winning multiple single gunfights here. It works though. It stalls off the attack, forces Wolves to rotate. The push is done. Diffuser on the ground. They gotta recoup and figure out how to problem solve this round. Well, you got the rest of W7M sitting quite pretty. I like the overall strategy that Wolves employed. Hit Solarium real hard. Make sure that nobody can pressure you from down below in trophy. Sweep forward, clear out the site. The bathroom control was what ultimately was their undoing. KZ is still in that same spot. Felipox on reinforcement not too far away. There goes Bibu and Herds. Cleans up the last two players of Wolves. W7M still very much in this, but they're gonna have to go perfect. The only thing here I fear for Wolves is if these rounds start slipping away and it's very close, you know, based off KC, for example, they might start losing some of that overconfidence that they're having where they will just go for crazy plays. They need to stay in that mindset, not fear losing. Because imagine this, you go to every major, you usually go out in groups, you go out in quarters at best. Yeah, losing this match doesn't mean you're going home. You will just go from upper bracket to lower bracket. You're still playing later today, actually. Um, or you'll play, sorry, later this tournament. But the point is that if the pressure starts getting to these players, 
be like, okay, guys, um, mm, I'm afraid of losing now. Things are not going well. Like, we tried going fast. Obviously, it's not working. They gotta stay in this. Because their mentality, their mental, could be their biggest enemy, their biggest obstacle right now to overcome W7M. So, one round, then it's 6 5. Another, then we're into overtime. Then things get really troublesome for Wolves. And then you go to Clubhouse thinking, damn, we should have won 2 0. Why didn't we do it? Why did we choke Five again, so to speak? So they really need to settle the nerves here. Could be a change up in strategy, could be a slower paced round. At the very least, W7M, they'll be expecting aggression, they'll be expecting a quick push. So I think it makes sense to spawn pick here. Because if you're gonna go quick, it means sprinting from spawn to the building, being a little bit more careless about the potential spawn peaks. But this looks like a slower Wolves attacking lineup. Flores, Twitch, Capital, they want a more proper execute style round. Lots of drones for Wolves. In terms of what they have outside of their main drones, they've already lost almost all of their intel, Nick. Only four drones on the board right now, other than, of course, the Rotero drones and Twitch drones, which will be nice in a pinch. That's more information for Wolves to capitalize off of this, as Mowgli is now droned in through Trench. This downstairs part of the map is completely vacant. W7M's first player and the first one in line of contact is somebody who's been performing quite well. It's Felipox on blue. And there's barbed wire in between Mowgli and him. Hmm. Mowgli's got a good idea, but you gotta do something to flush Felipox out of that position. Yeah, he, Felipox should never swing out and get aggressive here. He's got the barbed wire, maybe in the Fenrir F net mine. He needs to like, stay alive on Blue Staircase, so it's up to Mowgli and Wolves to problem solve, not Felipox. The back bar panel will now open up as it's hit by an EMP and a Selma. Meaning that JV92, who's holding that position, needs to be a bit more active now in his defense as he hugs that A-bomb chassis. You can watch Lobby and also watch Window into games. So they have partial library hand control here from Deadshot Repelling. They have the bubble opened up from the basement. If they can clear out the one person set up the bomb set itself of JV with the Capital 5, for example, they could take the go for a side execute. But there it is. Mowgli open things up. That's what they need. First pick is huge. No follow up, though, because Herds comes into action, losing half of his HP in the process. Rotero drones will go out. There's also one of those F knots. Oh, a nice shot from Herds on Dashinka. Wolves cannot lose the plot in this round. They are so close to sending this away. JV92 now taking some damage. It sounded like an explosive goes off. JV92 is flushed out of this position earlier, but he's certainly making it work from where he is. Now on big window, it's dead shot. Pitter patter with the suppressor on his gun. Bibu watching from above. These are the last two players from Wolves, and they're going to have a hell of a time to get on in. As now Deadshot keeps trading out HP, but neither he nor Bibu are closer Attackers to the objective. The They'll shuffle around the diffuser. The moment that Bibu hops in, he'll get hit with that Fenrir gadget. Lose his sight onto these players. JV92 out dueling him. It's all up to Bibu now, who vaults in. They swing, but Bibu needs to get every single kill. He'll attempt the plant, but they know exactly where he is. KZ looking for kill number 15, and he'll get it. Good God. Almost 40 kills for KZ in two maps. Stellar performance, and you gotta wonder if this goes to a map three, and let's say it goes far into the round count, that could be like, this is world record breaking kind of record that he's about to attempt here if he keeps going. Now, I spoke about the mentality of Wolves and kind of slowing down and not having confidence. And I, I gotta say, that's exactly what I feel like happened in that round. Mowgli got the opening kill on blue and he sprinted up the staircase. Been like, guys, let's explode on side. And the second he dies here to Hurts, that's when the crossfire on side that we see here leads to a second death. Where is the rest of the Wolves? It looked like they were trying to retear a drone below the window for an gadget the same second Moti got the kill, which meant they either couldn't jump in the window because the retear drone would kill them, or they simply just didn't communicate what the plan was gonna be. So if Mowgli rushes in, but everyone else is sitting far back, it's a uh, missynchronization issue. They couldn't plan, they couldn't get in. So not the best position to be in. We saw P4 there talking to Mowgli specifically about something. It didn't look like it was, uh, I wouldn't say a bad conversation, but like clearly something did not go according to plan that round. 
Either Mogna has to sit back and not go for that push, or his teammates, they have to follow through. It's not anyone's specific fault, but the team as a whole did not operate together. Hey, now Wolves, this is where things they start getting a little bit uh, dangerous. 6-5, their final attempt before overtime. They're still in the attack. Probably some of them still on the defense. They're gonna go to that basement bomb site. When they were there, the first time around, there was a side rush that coulda, woulda, shoulda worked out, but didn't. Oh. That shot didn't die this time, but got the opening pick. KZ could be the next one lined up as well with the play that he's playing over by library at Top Chimney. Far removed oh. from the action, and that's huge! Mowgli has taken him down. That's it. That's gotta be it. I, I, is gone. I find it such a challenge for W7M to overcome this. Wolves must be breathing a sigh of relief by taking these two players out. Now, obviously you can never count W7M out of the action, but Keep it the it's gonna fall really onto the shoulders of Hurt, but now he's gone as well. The French right now just a bit too hard to deal with. Fellafox and Nade as Nade sits on stairs taking out Mowgli. That's a big kill for this W7M team. And another from Nade now. As if Wolves are impatient and don't do their homework, they can let W7M get back in this round. And with the two picks that they've got, they might have just done that. It's one of those awkward fine lines where when they play fast from Wolves, it's when they get those opening kills, it's when they shine. But they need to understand that there's also this fine line of, okay, we got the kills we wanted and that we needed. Now we can take our time and slow it down. Bebo and Mokla, the two main frackers from this team so far. And also with all the soft reach destruction for the bomb side, Deathshot has three retire drones go up the floor. But besides that, they don't have a lot of options here. The only active drone remaining is Shinka's. Outside of that, you have no information for Wolves. Yes, you can use the Rotero drones, but they have a fuse on them. Eventually, they're going to blow up. So you can't just continue to use them. Now, you've gained some information. You know Nade is on blue, but do you know he has access to the M870? Oh. That is the question, because this is a one shot at that range. The moment that somebody from Wolves pushes onto blue stairs, W7M will punish them. Another Rotero drone will go out. One more remains. P4 will not follow up. Nade, unable to shoot it, so instead, he gets real aggressive on the stairs. He is not falling off of this position whatsoever. I love the way W7M is playing this. They are playing it perfectly given their numbers, Nick. And now the fire will go, which is stopping Wolves from rushing out. Here comes an adrenal surge, and the fire will finally slow down. Down goes Jenka to Felipox, who lights them all up! We're going to overtime! Getting the O2 opening kills, getting full map control, losing two players to not shaking the staircase, team flashing in the final moment of the bombsite rush, blinding your teammate was gonna take the gunfight, giving Felly Pox the advantageous position and gunfight, getting that 3k. That should have been the round victory for Wolves. This is where the mental game comes into play. This is where you start doubting yourself, you get frustrated, and you worry that you have thrown away the one chance you had at winning this 2-0, and maybe the one way to even win this best of three series at all. They have to close it out in overtime. They have three rounds to go. They gotta win two of them. Otherwise, they'll be kicking themselves over this round, especially for a very long time. I mean, it really did come down to information, right? Yeah. Wolves did not have any drones, but they were very slow to capitalize because they didn't know where anybody was. Now, you know that Nade is on blue, but there's a maestro unaccounted for. Yeah, you can speculate all you want that the maestro is inside the site, but that is really not a round that Wolves should have lost by any stretch of the imagination, Nick. They lose it because W7M basically plays perfectly given the situation they found themselves in. There, you don't win back-to-back -back majors while also finishing in the finals <laughs> of Six Invitational right before that without knowing a thing or two about playing virtually perfect Siege. And boy, oh boy, does W7M always show up when you need them the most. Also, Nate only has three kills, but two of them was in the previous round. So we can talk about impact kills right now. Yeah, he didn't do much in the first, but he put his team into overtime to tie things up. I mean, you can make a very credible argument that Nade's inability to get kills <laughs> up to this point cost his team round. Sure. However, he inarguably won that round, or at least set up Felipox to win the round. 
W7M support players don't get the love that a lot of other teams do because of the fact that Herds, JV92, and KZ are so good. We've talked an awful lot about KZ, and for good reason. He's sitting at 37 kills by my count between these two maps. We are in record-breaking territory if this goes to a third map and KZ does not fall off of a cliff. Now, he still has two rounds to continue to rack it up, but if Herds gets the leadoff pick and then can play strong over by that library hallway, then KZ might not have any kills left to get. But he gets on the board with Deadshot. Now it's Herds' chance, too. P4 the first kill, but KZ sweeps through him. And now it's W7M with the lead on their map. They sit on map point. I also think it's the first time last round we've seen W7M being really animated on their player cams, smiling, getting loud. Despite having some big moments on Oregon, despite having some good plan setups here in Chile as well, they've seen kind of, I don't want to say down or sad, but just they've seen quiet, where you gotta celebrate the small things, and you definitely gotta celebrate the big victories. That overtime round clutch from Nate and Felipox, that prompted them to get really loud. And for the first time on Hertz's face, because I've been watching his player cam for the majority of this, uh, or Casey and Hertz, rather, both of them, for the entire game, they just seem really down. Despite playing well, despite rounds being clutched out, there's no massive amounts of celebratory action or fist bumps saying, go on, guys. But now here in overtime, and they're on the Gatos there, that's changed. Big smiles, big celebrations. Let's go. 7 6 now. W7M for the first time in a very long time. Pretty much first time here in Chalet. They're in the lead, the round count. It will be a swap though. Every round we go from attack to defense, vice versa. So the Wolves will get two attacking rounds if we go the, th the distance. And W7M will get two defensive rounds if Wolves are to overcome this obstacle. The thing is, Wolves are also kind of running out of juice when it comes to strategy. They're doing the same thing now. I'm not saying it's a bad one. It worked last time. The Kaid Clash Basement Hold, or P4, you know, read to a blue staircase into bar. And Mowgli was there to get the double kill. They won the last time they did this. But it will not have that same surprising factor as the previous time around. Obviously, they've seen it. And they've not really played around. There's no capital, there's no Kali, there's no cap like a counter to the Kali here. So I'm not sure what the plan is, WSM. Not quite sure. Well, it could be another rush as well, but they open up that garage wall very effectively. First 45 seconds, that's good pacing for them. Given that neither of these teams are playing the two morale, you don't really need to worry about too much as teams don't actively trick either the wine or garage walls the way that we used to see. It's challenging to trick now with Thatcher being virtually unbanned forever and pocket EMPs being brought to by teams. Just in case the Thatcher gets killed early, you've got backup with Fellapox holding on to those smaller EMPs that can be a bit tricky to land, but teams usually know where the Electric Claw is. In this case, that's the only denial that's being brought by Wolves. But the halfway mark right now in the Clash, which was such an obstacle for W7M before, remains upright. It was Mowgli who was able to capitalize off of it. I say this, but Mowgli gets a kill. He's immediately traded out, and P4 is reduced to almost ashes at this point. W7M finding the picks they need, and most importantly for Wolves, though, KZ is the casualty. Now, site control is W7M's, and the return of the bomb site through blue is not going the way that Wolves had hoped for. The Nitro Cell goes off, but not before the Diffuser goes down. Shinka inside a connector. Leveling Felipox. P4 dies. Now it's JV92 in the ground. And Nade, who was phenomenal before on this particular bomb site on defense, needs to sit over top of that diffuser and find these three remaining players on Wolves. He's lined up one, gets the pick on to Bibu. Thinks there's somebody over towards blue, but he's exposed himself as well. Now they'll be able to hop onto the diffuser. Hurts type GG, but maybe a bit too prematurely. I know. Sometimes eating your words, not exactly appetizing, but for that round in particular, W7M is going to have to do that. And we will go to a 15th and final round between these teams. It's so hard to predict the outcome of these rounds because surely that's a done deal for W7M. They're in the bottom side, Wolves are far away, the plan goes down successfully. There's no C4 inside until it landed right on top of the plant cover. Didn't take down the planter though, so it will be a post plant, but the retakes are so clean from Wolves every single time. I think the big thing that happened though, was I believe it was Felipox, yeah, on Dokebi, walking in the main breach here, 
to try and like confirm the injured player of Deadshot and then just dying to the connected player of Shinga. If you stay outside the main breach, you cut the bombs at the half, you give your teammates crossfire, and Deadshot will not be revived in that round. So instead of covering the cross, it's a 50 50 gunplay. Shinga comes out on top, Wolves is staying in it. Do or die now. For W7M, they want to go a third map. And do or die in the sense that Wolves, they really want to send this home to Zero and avoid Clubhouse yeah, at all costs. Not just because they might lose it, but also because the more maps you can hide, the less strats you end up showing, the better it is for the longevity of your run in this tournament, as more things will stay available for later use. Boy, oh boy! If you hated W7M before, hmm. Herd's typing GG on that round just might make you hate him a little bit more. I will say, there was a time when Herds typed GG against Team Liquid and then a bunch of the Liquid fans came after him on social media, which, well, I know what that feels like. <laughs> it can be overwhelming. But Herds basically said people always cry that they want more villains. Yeah. And then you finally get villains Girl in the game and then you brigade them and send death threats to them. Yeah. How about we understand that, oh my, Mowgli almost perfectly traced through the wall, but the Mutafellapox can survive for now. Mowgli thinks he has an idea. Fellapox swings, he gets dead shot, the shotgun Ooh, comes out, oh, yeah. only good enough for one. As Mowgli has a shotgun of his own, the super shorty out dueling the SAS shotgun. WCM should know this will be a trophy solarium take because they have such a strong piano hole that it's very hard to pick apart. So I'm not surprised Philippox is roaming downstairs, but I'm a bit surprised at the lack of reinforcements, like people helping him either vertically or on solarium staircase Bob, itself, for example. He was kind of on his own on an island. He trades one for one, which is okay, but that's 13 kills Philippox, by the way, to five and seven dead shot. There's not Mowgli people who died, for example, or Ishink at this point sitting on 11, so it's very much tied up. We got the Brava camps getting intel here. It's very tight, tight round. Deadshot did have some very high value, high impact kills. Fair. When it was Wolves sitting on match point on their last attack. But yeah, I mean, I don't want to say because it, it sounds a bit mean-spirited, but of all the players to lose, I'm probably most comfortable losing Deadshot. You almost lose P4 from below, who's using those holes created by the buck, as now this bathroom hold from W7M was so formidable before. It's turning out to be quite effective this time, as down goes P4. Mowgli subduing JV92, but the Azami KZ is a little bit farther away. JV92 likely unretrievable at this point. Secured by Mowgli, W7M wisely falling off, allowing Wolves to take this, and instead, it's just a series of beachheads that they're making. Now, you're gonna have to tackle Piano, which you said was a heavy investment from W7M. Oh. Run out over on the balcony as Bibu has to contend with that. Shinka has Diffuser in hand. Herds is not able to get up there yet, but it stops Shinka from going! And their coverage is poor! Diffuser is dropped, there down goes KZ, and it's a 2v2 with 20 seconds left. Wolves has an option to stun no. the world by taking out the major champs in this first match, but Nade walks up, completely exposed, Bibu on repel, will swing in, and W7M stops the comeback from Wolves. We go to map three in stunning fashion, Nick. I mean, that right there, you're thinking, where's the car from B1 big on the repel? But the thing is, because they ran out the office door, they threatened this position. That was a perfect counter to the cover on their plan. And W7M, with smiles on their faces, they finally figured things out and read the situation, and they're gonna take us to map three. 18 kills for KZ. If the numbers of the previous map are to be believed, he is sitting at 40 kills through two maps. That is unheard of, but it was a team effort for W7M on Chalet. They don't win without the supporting cast, and now we have a best of one. Clubhouse will determine whether the French or the Brazilians move on. We'll be right back.
You wanted quality games? Well, you got them. What a map two between W7M and Wolves. And as we all wanted it to be, there will be a map three. But that's in a few minutes. Welcome back to our analyst desk where we'll be discussing map two chalet and break things down for you and prepare you for our third. Oh, I'm lost with me are Fabian and Fresh. And let's, let's just build it up once more. What a hell of a map, Fabian. Yeah, I mean, that was insane. That was just incredible. We're looking at two teams that are just going round to round, that it's back and forth, back and forth. And they seem to be, when they're actually doing things, both teams seem to be kind of perfect at what they're doing. And then somehow, the other team just pulls out a tool of their toolbox and just, yeah, we're going to dismantle you and you have nothing to say about it. Do you know what? I'm a siege purist. I just want to watch the highest siege possible, the highest quality siege possible. I don't necessarily care who wins. Maybe a little bit of an EU bias, but don't really care who wins. That was such a good map of siege. Would Following it, from another great map of siege. Would you call it quality siege? Would quality you give it siege. the seal of approval? Yes. Seal of approval. It was great. I mean, it had absolutely everything. I think even just the first couple of rounds, W7M playing specifically for the plant, then having to change their pace, tempo later on in their attacks. Wolves being 6-3 up, the jeopardy of that going back to overtime. Clutches, throws, like incredible map to watch. Just overall, two perfect teams. I said it in the first game map. This game is probably going to be one of the best we've seen at this event. And if it keeps up for map number three, just as it is, this might actually be the best game we're going to see this event. We are still, by the way, to remind everybody, this is match number one of the playoffs that will continue today, tomorrow, Wednesday, and then, of course, in the main event. So if this is what game one is serving us, yeah. I think we're going to have a feast fresh. Yeah, I think we are. And I think, you know, just talking specifically about the highlights here, I think Wolf started so well. I, I really did think that. And maybe, maybe not strategically, um, but the one thing that we was asking from them was improved team play. That's one thing that we've been talking about throughout this whole series. They were managing to recover 5v3s, 5v2s. Um, even one round that they, this one right here that was in the highlight, they brought it back from a 5v2 and 2v2. They lost the 2v2, but they were recovering them and the team play was absolutely showing to put them at the advantage. It's just retake after retake and just overall, Again, we come back to the same thing we said for map one. We didn't expect Wolves to have that much of a mid-round reconnecting to what we need to do. They didn't yeah. seem to have that. And today, it really played out well. However... Yeah? I do think they tossed this game. Because, obviously, everybody saw it. Five on two. You shouldn't lose those situations. And on top of that, not maybe did they only throw it in the actual game. They might actually have thrown it in the map bands. Because... Oh. They had the choice of overtime side, and they picked attack. And that's really strange, because like we said, Wolves are an 80% defense win rate and a 33% attack win rate coming into this. And they chose to go on attack in overtime. Obviously, it went down to that final round. Had that been a defensive round for Wolves, we're talking about Wolves that have just 2-0, you know, the current back-to-back -back major champions. Yeah, that, that would have been huge. But to also say that during the game, and even during the comeback that W7M did, their side was very quiet. And it's not until OT that spirits really rose, and we could definitely hear it then. Yeah, I mean, when we were thinking that they were going to lose, we came down when the score was 6-3. So we were kind of prepared that W7M weren't going to get this game. My notes were saying, W7M are falling for pressure. They finally have something to lose. They are this top dog. They're on top of the mountain. And now they can only go really down. So pressure is coming to them. Brazil wants to see them lift the trophy. And then they falter and fall apart. I, on, on home turf, that's another level. But there is one man that is really keeping up for, well, just keeping that fire roaring in the Team KZ wow. yet again. I just want to stress one thing before I ask you a question fresh. KZ, with the current kills on the two maps that he has had, 40 to 16, is KDR. This man is on course to beat the best of three kill world record. Which has been a long time since that was broken. Well. Yes, years at this time. point. Yeah. Uh, again, it's another huge map. And again, you know, he didn't deserve to be on the losing map, uh, losing team in map one. He was. He didn't deserve to be on it in map two. He wasn't. He managed to pull them through. Um, and there's n what more can you say about this guy? He spawned Beacon one time. This play in particular to win this round was very, very well played by him. The confidence to walk in in that 2v2 and take the initiative and win the round for his team. It's not just that he's baiting them and finding kills. Look at some of the impacts of these kills that he's having. And you're looking at a world quality player. This again, a round, huge retake in the post plan. 
he is one of the best players in the world. Before this tournament, he was being slightly overshadowed by Herds. Oh, sorry, before this game, he was being slightly overshadowed statistically by Herds, but they are both exceptional players. I mean, this is just an incredible team, but that's what I want to point out as well. I want to see the team do well. Yes. I don't really care about the kill record because, and I don't think any single player actually does either because they want to win as a team. They want to go through as a team because they cannot rely on one guy through every game. Well, let's talk then about map three. That's what we're going to turn our attention to because it is the mo most important one at this point. Clubhouse, you will see the entire pick ban uh, on that screen with W7M starting off on the attack. Fresh, what are we expecting on Club? It's a classic map. I'm worried. I'm worried. Oh I, said that I, thought, I said that I thought the Wolves had to get this done 2-0. They didn't. They go into map three. The reason that I'm worried is we've seen Wolves attacking strategy today to be fast, to be very erratic at times, to take risks. Clubhouse is a map where you really, really can't do that. You're forced into playing default in a lot of the rounds. There are very few rounds where you can take it fast. The only one that I can really think of being Jim, which is a Wolves classic where they can just run through the breach altogether and drop Logi Hatch. That's the only one. So I'm worried about Wolves attacking. And if a team can out default, like which one for me is better at doing the defaults? I would say W7M on the balance of things. So I'm worried because we're heading into Clubhouse. You basically took all the points there in like Sorry. one go. Sorry, that's, that's fine. That's, that's fine. my huge because brain. Because I just can just keep building on them. And when you said the Russian and Jim, because of how Wolves have played so far, W7M will definitely be prepared for yeah. just that. Um, because they've played it so much that, well, that's what they're going to be expecting. So even if they might not set up the entire strat for it, they'll at least be prepared for it. I think one thing we can definitely expect is a banger of a map three with how our first two have gone down. I am so excited. I hope you have some heart medication next to you because this is going to be definitely palpable. So Fresh Fabian, thank you very much. We are ready for map number three. So which one do we go for? Do you want a close up for this one? Let's go to map three. Pango and Taro, take it away. Well, thank you very much. And yes, we have been treated to an honestly a spectacle so far. Yep. I did not expect either of these maps to play out the way that they have. And I don't expect Clubhouse to play out the way that I imagine either, which is yeah. it's going to be a quick stomp for one of these teams, which means that if we buck that wisdom, then next thing you know, we get a competitive match. That's all I want. I'm kind of happy we go third map because and, and Fabian, genius, right? He called in the very beginning, this might be one of the best, like, series of this entire tournament. He said that as an Oregon. And so far, it's followed that trend. Who doesn't love a 7-7, you know, final 15 round situation where one team clutches to get in there and clutch to finish things out. And now we've got a clubhouse. But I do share the same sentiment as the desk. I worry a little bit for Wolves. The rush, fast-paced attacking style, not all that common to do on this map. It's very hard to pull off. But they do have a little bit of an ace up their sleeve, maybe. I would assume now, with Maverick being banned, that Tuberau will be banned from the side of W7M to match. Otherwise, this will be a series that comes down to breaching the walls with heart destruction and utility, which is very unlike Oregon and Chalet from what we saw so far. Kite, okay, also not a bad ban. You still have Tuberau and Bandit slash Mute in action, but w w them will respond back with the Kite ban to make things a little bit more, okay. <laughs> Wolves are a little bit uh, trolling here, okay? <laughs> they ban the Maverick, and then maybe, so my assumption is a former player, is that you ban the Maverick, and you see if your enemy bites. And if they don't bite, you will finish that yourself and round off the bans by doing Maverick into Tuberau, and you get the Kai ban on, on top from your opponent. So all of a sudden, what could have been a game that will be heavily played around Walt and I, because you don't have Maverick open, become and say, okay, the only thing that can stop you is the basics, the defaults, the mute, the bandit. So nothing too out of the ordinary here for both teams. They'll be happy with that. But I do think, like Fresh said on the desk, that this will favor W7M over that of Wolves. You and I also discussed something similar while we were in between these maps, saying that the only thing worse than a 2-0 blowout is to have these first two maps be electric and then have map three completely deflate the series by being so dominant. Obviously, for the average viewer who wants a quick matchup or wants a close matchup, they're going to be upset by that. But for fans of W7M, they'll get to tell that story if W7M capitalizes. Same with Wolves if Wolves dominates here. Now, an interesting statistic that was given to me by our good friend Jesse yes, yes. It's always giving you the tips. I mean, he told me this in the green room. Oh. You were too busy staring in the mirror at your duck shirt. Okay, relax. Jesse said the last time that a team was bounced to the lower bracket mm. by Wolves, they went on to win six invitational. That was G2. 
So by the way, if that stat is wrong, you blame Jesse. But <laughs> thank you, Jesse, for Damn. providing it. Thank you, Jesse, for providing it. Getting thrown under the bus here, being a kind soul in the world of so much misery that is not okay. Mystery though, that's what Wolves are feeling right now. If you watch that previous map of Chalet, one could argue that they should have closed out that series 7-5, but they didn't. They went into overtime, and that has gotten us here to Clubhouse. So, mental state comparison here. WCM feeling really good about getting a third shot in terms of map, whereas Wolves, they're gonna be like, damn, should have already won this. Nade with a little bit more of an unusual pick these days to fuse inside of office to destroy the floor inside of kitchen. Very much like on Chalet when you go on office balcony inside the window and you will fuse the primary floor as well. And it's very safe. By doing it this way, you don't gotta worry about C force below when you're Bach or Sledge. So I really like this. I also know that this was a strat back in Brazil many, many, many years ago. That So this has been seen before, but not in recent time. So this is one of those maps, by the way. Remember we talked about the application? When we talked about the application of certain operators like Ram that we saw a lot of on Chalet. We talked actually about how Clubhouse doesn't really see a lot of this operator. And again, you can bring different levels of destruction. I love the fact that yeah. on this bomb site, there is an abundance of destruction in that kitchen part of the map. But beyond that, vertical play does not really exist. So bring the fuse. Nade can rain those cluster charges down on them and cause some serious issues. Well, if it isn't KZ to get the first pick <laughs> as well, he's chasing the best of three kill record. He stands at 55 kills held by Citizen. We'll actually play the, what is it, the loser of this matchup later today. Sonics will be in action against whoever loses here. I just want to point out how phenomenal that play there was with WCM with the three Bs and cases holding on tight. And they're making progress everywhere. Few shots going up towards the bomb side itself here. And P4 took a lot of damage actually from that. Dead shot drops. There's a Nitro Cell tossed out by Bibu. He's the only one so far who's been able to draw blood from Wolves before P4 does it as well. A push from all over the map. Over by Blue. Over by Dirt. Nade is sitting very pretty for the time being. KZ drops two kills for him. Seconds left. Nate attempting the defuse plant. P4 needs to get to the bomb site. KZ has his eyes on him over from Church. And of course it's a KZ 3K to start this map. Oh boy. He really is gonna go for it, huh? And very well might get there. Despite Valkyrie being open there for Wolves and despite being in play, every single player was watching other members of the team. And that probably just means that there are no active outcams with useful information available to them. So you're playing completely in that gray zone where you don't know what's going on. And it very much felt like that as well, watching Wolves in this round. They're getting fused on side, people dropping hatches, dirt control in control from the attack inside as well. So all of a sudden, you have no idea what's going on you feel like there's enemies everywhere yet nowhere at the same time and i think if you're wolves look at how they played oregon look at how they played chile i think they want to get active on other bomb sites i think you want to play a lot of gym maybe even bar and then cc basement will be like your tertiary third option because i think you need space to work with at least the wolves in this series so far where we've been impressed and we've seen the match and outright beat WCM has been when they've search. been proactively running around, shooting people, taking crossfires, Second and remaining. working the map. So playing these more static, laid-back bomb sides, that's when it comes down to that uses. default stuff that the disc spoke about. And that's what WCM, they are just outclassing in most of the opponents in the entire game right now, and has been for the last entire full year of Siege Pro League, basically. Like the start from W7M. Clubhouse had the distinction of being the most defender-sided map for a long period of time, only being eclipsed recently by skyscrapers, you saw from the graphic, but still holding one of the most defender-sided numbers. Attackers are starting to win more the deeper we go into this series, and I think it's necessitating a change to the way that attackers go about it. Very strong defenders, nerfs to the frag grenades, those both play a huge part as to why attackers are not what they were. Fresh actually had a great tweet about it last night. I don't know if people saw, but honestly, Fresh has been doing an outstanding amount of work for this event, given the fact that he's technically not even been working until today. Yep. So, but boy, oh boy, hard pressed to find a talent with a greater work ethic than Jack Fresh 
Allen. Now, Felipox and JV slaughtering these two Wolves players offside. Herds dropped by Mowgli, who alongside another player from Wolves is inside of construction. It was P4, but he's now pushed back. And construction is W7Ms for the taking. Wolves hold map control, get a pick. Drop back. I like that. But you see this, the second we see Wolves sitting bomb. still, just like waiting for things to happen, that's when they get picked apart in the gunfire strategically, the walls get opened up, and when Mowgli swings out, you know, across the map from construction, that's when they start getting the kills. I, we don't want to see Wolves sitting still, if they can avoid it, but on Clubhouse, you also can't just run around endlessly at all times. Let's see if they can open up this wall. It's gonna be a keep it barrier, I believe. Nope, that's been dealt with, I guess. Blocking off those bandit batteries, so Nade will be successful as there is no current wall denied. B1 bandit is already in the grave. Impact will not do anything against an exothermic charge, so wall will be open in a second. KZ will push from the other side of the map, Nick, right now inside of construction. There goes that breach. All three players from W7M that look to get into the site. There's four of them, but the three of them closest by were all spread out. Down goes KZ. That's construction, presumably now, firmly in control of the Wolves. And P4 looking onto the balcony, punishing JV92. The advantage for W7M has evaporated. A 4v3 has become a 3v1 now. With Wolves getting the final two picks in its Mowgli's hand to do it. Felipox the last to die. And these teams, of course, will tie it up. What a bloody surprise. It comes down to another retake where Shinke will run in through construction and take control and get some kills back to even down the man count. The bomb side itself of Jim is quite difficult to pick apart. You got those window jump ins, not ideal. Running into that gym breach, oh, like the jacuzzi breach rather, pretty difficult without bathroom control. So a lack of intel there as well from the side of W7M. And despite getting those first opening kills, they didn't do a whole lot afterwards. They spent a lot of time kind of lingering around, waiting for things to happen. And I do think Mowgli found that early pick was massive to the team. And sorry, P4 it was, not Shinga. Retaking control, just kind of seal the deal. The moment you lose window pressure, you see Moki get active, he knows he's safe, and he finds the final two members off the attack inside. 1-1. One, one. We're no wiser to knowing who's gonna take this. No, and I mean, this is, this is essentially what most people predicted. I will say, you have the two-time defending major champs, runners-up at SI. They have made the grand finals of the last three major events. Making the grand finals of every single major event in 2023, irrespective of the outcome, yeah. is impressive enough as is. So the fact that Wolves are able to push W7M to a third map in the fashion that they've done it, obviously shows that Wolves are a relatively evenly matched team compared to W7M. This, of course, is bad news for Sonics, who play whoever emerges on the wrong side of this matchup, though Sonics has been a very impressive team so far this tourney as well. Honestly, the parity here at Six Invitational has been quite good. I like the fact that teams are able to keep pace with W7M because from a storyline perspective, it would be a little boring if W7M just bulldozed their way to the finals. Now, speaking of bulldozing, they're gonna bulldoze their way right up Rafters. Felipox, good for a single pick, almost finding another on Nabibu who's been dropped. But it's Shinka on Tachanka to stop that from happening. Mowgli being a bit more aggressive, ensuring that Rafters and Catwalk is not taken by W7M again so quickly, though Mowgli's been droned out. And he'll be harassed by said drone. Still in this position, but a lot of angles to watch. There's no Kiba barriers up there whatsoever to give him some added protection. So if you're a team like W7M that can hit your shots, Nick, oh, you yeah. can punish him quite effectively. I love the bandit play, though. I'm an OG kind of guy. I love seeing simplicity, but Hertz doesn't like seeing that at all. He says that wall has to be opened up for my team. We'll shut down B from the verticality downstairs inside a blue staircase. An operator that we don't see very often, Tashanka from the Shinge with 20 Molotovs in pocket could really slow things down here for the offense, but it's Mowgli who is the main uh, focus point right now under so much pressure from so many different angles with not much intel to work with. He's got the one Kiba barrier. It was a small oversight on my part. I apologize. I hope everybody will forgive me. <laughs> Band of batteries being shot away at. Advantage still in favor of W7M, but they are having a great degree of difficulty opening up this breach. The point, Selma. There goes the single Selma, and this one should work. I don't know if they're going to be able to get through it. I, they'll be able to vault through it. Oh. oh, Mowgli punished by KZ. 
sits inside of Garage. Now it's Deadshot, knowing that the Lion of Herds is not too far removed, but Deadshot's focus has to be on the Breach. Because of the fact that Wolves lost their player on Raptors earlier on, w 7 has been able to hang on to it, and that is a very strong position. As KZ wraps around and instead will go towards construction, but Shinka hears that barricade break. Out goes an air jab. Shinka needs to stay away. KZ dies. Herds a kill as well. Wolves reduced to just Shinka inside of construction, and Herds gets the job done. As he'd come up red stairs, got the pick at top red, and then watched construction quite intently. W7M, answer back. Yeah, and I mean, this looks more like you would expect from these two teams where the fundamentals are just in check there from that side. And yeah, a very convincing round. Looked like a very fast attack there on CCTV Garage, but Mowgli actually held onto that ground for so long. He even made it back towards the bottom side before he got shut down from bottom garage and caught off guard. He thought he was hiding on the chassis and nobody would check it. But of course, if a team would check those common angles, it would be W7M. Beeble fall into verticality. Casey actually had a yellow ping, so there was indeed intel from a drone, I imagine, or a player assumption. And then we see them flop out the bomb side, leaving Shinka, who's on plant and I, in construction with no help to be had. <laughs> well, close as it can possibly get. And now it'll be another defense downstairs. See if any of the lineup being brought from the attackers will change up. Of course, you've got 10 seconds to lock in these sixth pick ops. Five seconds left. Osa is available. We've seen this operator brought a number of times. As she can provide great value, especially if you're going to cut across to what's known as pulse spot, which is that single panel on the left side the moment you get to the bottom of the stairs of basement. Open up one of those walls, get the talent shield down, and then play off of it. We do have uh, clarification on the way that these will go. The winner of this match plays Sonics. So SQ gets either Wolves or W7M. Either way, yeah. from the way these teams have played, SQ will have their hands full, but Sonics have also looked like a mighty good team. So, oh my, there's no way they pulled this off, right? Heard, Ice pounced upon. Excellent defense so far. And Mowgli's looking for more as he engages outside. Fellapox has to drop and use that air conditioning unit to his advantage, as it can't be shot through. The buck almost lost his life as well, and Wolves would have had an excellent start to it. This is what I, what I mean. When they can move around the map dynamically and go for those engagements, that's when the Wolves they shine the most. That's when I see when I see more of that from them, and they take down Hurts, Hibana, the main hot breacher. They're gonna slow things down away. drastically here for the attack inside. Casey still forced to use one or two Jackal scans to ensure that there are no roamers in play, but we know from the outlines and the top-down view right here on your screen that all five defenders have fallen back to side. And why would that be if the roam worked? Why would you go back? Well, it's very simple. The person that you killed was Ibana. You are now basically banking on the fact that only one secondary harbinger is in play, either from Buck or from Capital. That means all you can open is W7M. There's two hatches. You gotta choose between blue, kitchen, and of course a bar hatch. That means that triple wall church or double wall church, whatever, will be closed off. You have very limited access points now on the attack. Dirt isn't open either. So you have such limited amount of angles to work with and this is where uh, the defense they shine. Oh, it's soft, what do you know? <laughs> 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 they could go third, I guess. All of that speculation and ultimately all for naught. But still limited access points here. It's gonna be messy. Probably drop down the hatch, take uh, dirt control if you want to, but that bottom main staircase you can't get much from. A lot of teams like to bring two dedicated hard breachers and then the can openers, or one hard breacher and then lots of can openers on the side. We talk about that when this round is finished. Chinka gets dropped from a long range angle over in church. As you can see, the wall adorned with his blood, and now KZ will follow up, but he doesn't see Mowgli in that position. Now it's Velopox nearsighted as he looks to walk in. Mowgli dies, the first one from Wolves in the ground. A vault in as Bibu greets Velopox. Nade kills P4. Final two players, both by that church wall. Now inside of Moto, they're nearsighted. Fire going out in front of Shinka as he's dropped. And it's dead shot, a team kill. It's all him versus JV92. JV still nearsighted, getting this plant down, but he has to fall off, and now Point of no return. Deadshot has all the time in the world, and he secures the kill. JV92 allowing him very graciously to get the pick instead of bailing off and costing his team the round. Either way, JV92 knew 
it was all over. 2-2 two, two, through four rounds, just as we expected. If that shot gets the team kill there and then doesn't clutch out the round, that'll be another hit scratcher for Wolves. They don't need more of those. But in similar fashion as to the second map of Chalet, they will call their technical timeout after four rounds despite winning. And yes, it was close, but more importantly, I think I really value this where you get ahead of the problem, you prep for the following rounds to come, get a good first half of confidence, and go into your attacks afterwards, of course, if you are Wolves. P4 will talk to the team as Lilo sits down and lets it all unfold. KZ got three kills in the first round. One kill since then, but as we have talked about throughout the course of this broadcast, and anybody who goes over W7M, W7M games will tell you this is a team that has a lot of depth in it. Herds can have an incredible round. JV92 can have an incredible round. We saw Nade get high impact kills on Chalet, while Fellow Fox led the way in terms of kills, competing with KZ for a while until eventually KZ had liftoff. So if all of the players are getting active here on side of W7M, then you're gonna have your hands full. Good news, there really hasn't been any poor performances from Wolves. Their worst performing player so far to my eye is Deadshot, mm. but he's still had some high value picks as well. Additionally, the other four players from Wolves have showed up quite well. After the timeout is called, upstairs to Jim Bedroom. Wolves will go. 10 seconds to insertion. I feel like when it's a technical timeout called by the coach, but it's one of the Five players doing the vast insertion. majority of the talking, which isn't always the, the common factor for Wolves, Attackers this must be a more strategical oriented timeout where P4 felt like he needed 60 seconds to just truly talk to his team and get a point home, because it's hard to say, okay, guys, play this bomb side, pick these operators, you talk a bit, the round starts, it's messy. You want the players fully focused for the round to come, so, early timeout taken. Wolves, they have no parachute now. This is it for them. Of course, with WCM, they can still call theirs, which would allow Wolves to talk to their coach amongst each other again, but not by their choosing. Operators are not gonna change all that much. Still wall denied economy here from the side of defense with the mute and the bandit. Intel being brought by the Valkyrie. And of course, playing around the timer here, the clock, the Goyo canisters to slow things down, stop a rush, the push. Or if they think that the enemy is going to be going too slowly here. With three members on the wall, you could be thinking this could be a rush, but no. We see a floor stone going out. They're going to join this first, but there are three guns there. They really want this bathroom wall opened up. B1 Bandit will stop it for now, putting down that Bandit recharge. And now it's problem solving time for W7M. Launching drone. That's two Rotero drones used by KZ. A third will go out as well. Three of the four Rotero drones used to explosive effect in the first half of the round means that you are very likely at this point just opening up soft walls and also taking care of that utility. That will stop you from getting in from Jacuzzi and potentially construction. Herds looking for a pick, but he looks oh. the wrong way. He looks to the right. Oh. Bibu picking up two huge picks, looking for a third, but Nade outduels him in that regard. Felipox now under fire as he's found himself inside of the site for a short period of time, and then it's Mowgli to get it on the action. And Wolves, wow, two in a row, and now they gain the lead. Experience there is showing from Beep was saying, he know he is doomed in that position. He can trick the first Selma, but the second time around, it'll be made with flashbangs or grenades, and most importantly, an offensive push toward him. So what does he do? He prones below the rotate, knowing he'll get flashed, knowing that he is probably gonna die in that position, but he gets two kills in the process, and those two kills is the entire defining factor of whether or not WCMM can go for a plant, or if they cannot. Small things here defining these moments in the rounds, all the way starting on Oregon, following through on Chile, and also happening on Clubhouse. And Wolves, they got this final bump set ahead of them. They can go to Bar if they want to, or they can go to CCTV. Bar not been shown yet, might not be necessary. But what is necessary is whoever gets this opening kill and can hold that mad advantage. <laughs> Frustration. I have not seen herds this frustrated right? in a long time. And I mean, we always go back to the player cams, but boy, oh boy, 
he's wearing it more than the rest of his team. It's long faces when they lose, but Herds is showing that emotion that we love. And we like to see it. One of the beautiful things about player cams is that you get an opportunity to see it firsthand. I guess it's worth mentioning that this is the quote-unquote last dance for WCVM as an organization with this roster. The five players will likely go elsewhere, but at least these five players under this brand and this name will be parting ways after Six Invitational. And of course, that can add a bit of extra pressure on the shoulders of the players, not knowing for certain if they have a new home or not. But they are good players. They have what it takes. It's been proven many times before. Right now, what they gotta prove to us is can they breach this wall right now? Beef who has tricked the first set, trying for the second, and I believe, no, he's not gonna stick it. I actually think he might have had it if he did. Beef is gonna peel off, not take that risk, because if he does mistime it, the exothermic charge would go off, and he'll either injure him or outright take him down. But that burns a full minute here. Mind you, Tuberau, Maverick, and Kaid all banned out between these two teams. Both have made a handshake deal saying, we want to play around utility and wall deny and make it difficult for attackers to gain that first step, which is to open up those walls. Good patience right now from this attacking lineup at W7M. You still got plenty of time to drone things out. You've got three drones remaining, but that's it. No additional drones being brought. No Flores, no Brava. First one to die is P4. Previous time that W7M executed on this bomb site, if you recall, they grabbed Raptor's control oh. really early on. And I said good patience from W7M, but not the same can be said for Wolves as they are going for broke, but you've got so many bullets. Why not use them all to your advantage? Shinka, he does just that. Deadshot also on the board, Attackers but will now down. need to ascend the red stairs. W7M know this. The bees are going off. Deadshot is trapped. All he can possibly do is rotate over towards main stairs now. I mean, I guess he's got the Keratos, right? He can shoot through the floor. But JV92 has no problem getting that diffuser down. And Deadshot is pounced upon by KZ. 3-3 the first half. No way to get closer than that. There really isn't. And the thing is, you might be thinking, what are Wolves doing in that round? Why are they swinging everything? Well, it's very simple. Strategically, they need to get the timer low enough to go for plant deny with like the, you know, C4s, with the fires and Tishanka. When you lose the catwalk player of P4 so early in the round, you really have lost all your strategical advantage. Because the second you lose Raptors control in Garage, everything else follows shortly after. So you're kind of forced to go, okay, we're playing 4v5, our strategy is, you know, down the drain. We need to find a new opening. That's why three members together swung everything. And it's why when you have a player play Cowboy Raptors like before, it's important to understand what your position is in the strategy. And to simply stay alive for as long as possible is arguably the best case outcome that it can be expected, as you cannot expect before to get multiple kills inside of Raptors necessarily. So that's why they swung the breach. It's why they swung out from the hallway, and it's why things fell apart really quickly once yeah, that ball started going. And that's gonna say a 3-3 half. Looking back to map number one, we saw a 3-3 half. Looking at map number two, we did see a 4-2 in favor of Wolves. But that was awesome, incredible clutch play and team coordination from Wolves. My point is, it's been a very close series all the way throughout, and it doesn't necessarily look like there's a clear favor on attack or defense. It comes down to individual performances amongst these teams in any given round, more so than the side they're playing on. So, second half, how do these teams handle this, and what do we immediately see changed up? Well, from Wolves, honestly, a very similar lineup to the way a lot of teams run on Clubhouse now. You bring one main hard breacher, even though some teams will run two. You bring the Hibana in the hands of P4. Bibu will run Grim, and you've got access to the can opener there as well. Look at that mute jammer stopping any possible drone from getting to Herds, who, while playing on Solus, will also gain information. He gets thrown out from construction, but not before Deadshot has died. And now bullets will come through the wall and push him off of that spot. Two drones shot away at so far. A third will go in after him, and it's a nice shot from Mowgli to capitalize. Stop as the drone heads. work will continue, and Mowgli drone can move control. forward before he himself will decide to gather information. You see here what they can muster up, though. 
Still got time, still got the numbers, but missing the vertical play of Bok is definitely gonna be a thorn in their side because they wanna open up that kitchen floor. They want the Bok for that job. Well, IQ, does the secondary soft breach. She has those grenades. Same thing goes for Ibana. Of course, flashes over Don't secondary soft breach charge as well. So really limited tools here available for the attack inside. And when, when WSMM had that same issue with heart breaching, they actually ended up struggling themselves because they couldn't do what they wanted to accomplish. Well, time to make a new door. Got the pick. Now, hard breach going off. And the hatches These will be opened up. Has been dropped. Which will allow more pressure to be exerted Attackers by this Wolves team. Recall last time, I think it was when W7M was attacking the same site, they lost the Hibana early. So the mm -hmm. fact that P4 is still involved and is still using those hard breach gadgets of the X-Kairos to influence this setup is enormous. Still one can opener as well for Bibu in pocket. Will it go on to church? Where will the Grimm's position be? That is the question. This is a very bad spot for Shinka as he stares down a black mirror. Wait a minute, hold on. Bibu's in the sight. Mowgli killing Nade. Felipox drops as well. JV92, one pick from Dirt Tunnel, swinging out looking for more, but he gets destroyed by P4 and Wolves with their first attacking round. Very, very small gap there, and Wolves didn't even know that the gap was there. They had the beast put out on the ward in the mirror window, but he was looking the wrong way. He was looking towards Dirt Tunnel, and when you're playing that third box on the mirror window, your position, arguably, is to look towards blue. That's what the mirror window's overseeing, but maybe they're thinking, there is no way they will push in front of a mirror window and just take blue control. Well, if you were to think that, you'd be wrong. This is Wolves. You saw them play Oregon. You saw them play Chalet. There is no way that WCMM should be underestimating their ability to not care about the structural setup when they know they can go for broke and get those kills. So they get that round. Wolves are in the lead. After throwing, arguably throwing, costing, losing that second map that should have been theirs. There is still showing us a lot of signs of life, of the quick play, the teamwork, and look at this, everything is covered. Mowgli people covering each other. There's a trade on every single player, so even if w won their first gunfight, they had to win a second one right after, all that push would not be stopped. Five seconds to insertion. Attackers are heading out to the- Spoke a little bit about kills, by the way. Yeah. We did speak a little bit about kills. I think there's something interesting to note here. So while Citizen holds the best of three kill record with 55 kills, there is a second record that is also in jeopardy being broken by KZ. In terms of the most kills at a major international siege competition, focusing on majors and the Six Invitational as well, the record is 49 kills, which is held by Nesk. KZ is only three away, by the way. From time. From time. Yeah. Three away from the same total. Yeah. Four kills on Clubhouse from where we are right now. And KZ, who just died, by the way, would break that record. But he's not going to be able to do it all on his own. He's going to rely an awful lot on W7M. Also showing up, Bibu walks in. The Mirror of Herds dies. Wolves' attacks are so clinical. And Bibu using that old ACOG. Oh. Showing how much he can do, but it's Nade who wins the round, despite the fact that it looked like Wolves was going to do it. What is happening here in this matchup? This is the one thing I did not want to see from Wolves for a very good reason, and Jack spoke about this on the desk segment right before this map started. This is the number one rush strategy that comes to my mind when you think of Wolves direct bombs that Rush executes. It is so predictable, it is readable, and it's been done so many times with way too much success for any team to not know about it and always have that in the back of their head like, oh, they might go for this. And it doesn't pay off. Sure, it's close, it comes down to a 1v1, but that is one of those rushes that is just too practiced and too rehearsed. And look, Hertz throws a C4 immediately, not because he's like, oh, I'm hurt, I'm gonna throw a C4, because hey, if I throw a C4, I know I'll get at least one kill, I'll stall out the push. But the thing is, that C4 took down two members. That C4 changes the outcome between Wolves being in a favorable spot and an unfavorable position. So just like that, it's red, it's countered, and the ground is done and dusted extremely quickly. 
It's a nice try, and I like the confidence of most, but that one was not it. It also stands to reason, Nick, that the more rounds played, the higher likelihood it is for KZ to get these kills, so. True. I don't think KZ came into this matchup thinking about chasing that kill record. I've spoken to a lot of teams when, it, when you get into the game, you're just focused on winning the game. That's yeah. really it. They don't care about the glory beyond that because I can guarantee you that if KZ was presented with the option of breaking that record but losing this match oh, yeah. or not breaking the record but winning the match, he would pick the latter every single day of the week. And I have to guess that most players here would agree with that. Yeah. Your right. focus is being an SI champion, not holding a record that might be nice to have now, but ultimately means nothing. Because you can't physically pick that record up the way you can physically pick up the SI hammer. It's true, and the bigger thing is just to channel that confidence that you're winning every single gunfight, like put the guy in a good operator, put him on an entry, make him work in favor of your team, and just utilize that sheer skill and confidence in the server. And I feel it would say Casey's done a great job at that throughout the series, always being in the fray of things, in the middle of things, always trading his teammates and getting kills. And when they're behind the numbers, he's the first guy to swing to even down the man count. And right now in this round, he's playing practically on the main staircase, on the roam right now, looking to do that same thing again. Attackers have located a bomb. He's not being quite active with his gadgets, too, to just maybe give a little bit of a leg up to whomever finds themselves confronting those Wolves players, nearsighted as they may be. Droned out over by Jacuzzi now, KZ, the man of the hour, by main stairs. This is a downstairs hold. Mowgli's in pursuit as KZ finds his own way back to the main floor. And with just about a minute to go, I think it's a good Ooh. idea to potentially get close to the bomb site. He picks up a kill onto P4 and now looks for the hatch as well as he'll get droned out and shot away at through the wall. The housing of his optic actually prevented him from seeing that drone, and it's his undoing. But still, one kill is good enough yeah. to slow down wolves for the time being. It's very impressive. It was like he navigated a maze, but he had the map for where to go at the right times there, completely avoiding wolves for long enough, because now, while he only get one kill short, he burns so much time and so many drones. Now, wolves gotta go too quick to check the angles. The castle barricade goes to the bottom of the stairs, and fella pox will form an exploratory committee to see what the chances are of getting a kill. He finds nothing for his troubles. Down goes Mowgli to Herds. The seesaw match coming down to a seesaw round where anybody, anybody can win it, especially with Wolves pulling it off. Shinka now attempting that plan on the pull spot that we talked about before. Deadshot watching the crossover towards Church, lighting up Nade. Diffuser goes down successfully. Deadshot is still upstairs with Bibu miles away, by the way, from where the case was planted. All you need to do is wait for these two players from W7M to get upstairs. It'll be a retake led by Herds up main stairs, and it will be Bibu watching that angle, but Herds manages to evade him for now. Timer at the halfway mark. Where is JV92? He hops on Diffuser, but line of sight favoring the buck. JV92 cannot long arm it, but he's going to try to get innovative, putting his back up to the shelf, and he pops onto it. But Deadshot is there to stop him in his tracks. Herds with the kill on Nabibu, but it's all for naught as time runs out. And Deadshot collects the kill, even though the Diffuser was already past the point of no return. Wolves grab their fifth round. We gotta talk about the supportive work there from Shinka. Without hesitation, goes bottom main, just sprints through the main hallway, gets the gun to side, no hesitation, hops straight on the plant on the back wall of the B bomb side. And this is a very common plant spot when it's very clearly orchestrated and set up with utility. We don't see it all that often, off, you know, just on the fly as a problem solving mechanic. And the entire team worked off of that. Shinka said, I'm gonna plant here, and they knew what that meant. People will lock down the missus flank. The buck on the hatch will lock down the bomb site itself for the cover. And also, Shinka was the player who got the yellow pink wall bang off the road clear on KC. We see it here, straight on the plant. Deadshot covers, people covers Deadshot from Blue Hatch and Kitchen Hall. It's beautiful. All things are accounted for, but they're accounted for within five seconds. Rose opened the bottom main staircase barricade and the hatches with like 30 seconds left in the round. Seven seconds later, they're planting with perfect cover. 
WCM not finding the answers and not having the foresight in these rounds to expect what's about to happen. Again, very, very small things to find out of that round. If you look at the hatch and kitchen, all our wolves are on the bomb side together and they immediately clear the, the evil eyes from the maestro, they deny the intel, so they don't know where the planet is going down. The C force goes completely wide downstairs, and just like that, Wolves looked like they just destroyed W7M on fundamentals, prediction, and setup in a single round. Well, timeout called by W7M. Long faces from these players. We talked about the frustration that comes into this and mentally speak from experience here. Not that you were often in this position, Nick, but the times that you were, what do you think is going through the heads of the W7M players? Well, this is a tough one because it's not that they're losing, you know, easy gunfights or somebody's making a bad mistake, swinging the wrong thing or throwing their lives away. This is simply from a strategical point of view. They are being outclassed. So, I think if we go back to Chalet, the way Wolves, they rush the bomb site multiple times, WCM, they're not quick to adjust to saying, guys, we need things to slow, like ways to slow them down. Because if I am WCM, I'm not gonna play five guys in CCTV. I'm gonna have a guy play construction. I'm gonna play either Ella Mines or Fenrir or something to slow the enemy down because Fenrir is open and available. And if you put them close to the bomb site, you'll be alerted when they're in the site itself. And that's where Wolves want to be. If you extend out those gadgets a little bit further away from the bomb site, you will get a small pre-warning that something is going on. Because imagine that a single Fenrir disc or the Banshee was in construction, you get the alert that something's happening on the backside before they reach the bomb site. So I feel like WCM playing their cards a little bit too close, but can you blame them? When you've been bomb site rushed so many times, both Oregon and Chalet, you don't want to roam. You don't want to extend out around the map because when you did that previously, you lost the bomb site. So I just think that for a best of three series, Wolves have done such a great job at getting into the minds of their opponent, make them question, what should we even do? This whole series, Nick, has been pretty respectable for yeah. the attackers, which completely, again, bypasses the conventional wisdom we had coming into this match, which is, well, these are defenders side of maps, the defenders are going to do well. Both teams have excelled on attack here. Yeah. You know what? Doki made a tweet a few days ago saying, only bad teams struggle on attack. Look at T2, look at us. We have three attack around wins on average. What we're watching right now, there's just no bad teams in the server. These are both world-class teams who knows how to attack when they need to. Well, I mean, we talked about this as well in previous matchups where it's there was a massive meta shift. Grenades, obviously, nowhere near as potent as they were. Defenders, very, very strong. And for some of the teams competing here, you've only played 10 official matches yeah. over the last four months. So you don't exactly have a lot of time to get those game day reps in. Scrims are scrims, but scrim quality varies by region. Yeah. It might just take some time for teams to come to terms with where the defenders are at now and adjust accordingly. We are already seeing in real time that defender win rate steadily drop point by point, day by day. Now, here we go. Wolves walk in, Deadshot finds two picks, just like that. KZ drops as well to P4. Wolves only need two more kills to secure a victory over the defending major champs. JV92 and Nade stand alone against a full Wolves lineup. Oh, but JV92 gets one, Nade gets two as well. And we find ourselves in a 2v2 with a minute to go. This is really quite a remarkable matchup. This happened on Chalet, right? And this time, don't have the fuse case either. They're on the site, but attackers don't care. Now the attackers become defenders because they have sight. Nade just needs to sit pretty. He'll swing over. A couple more bullets left, and JV92 is in on the action as well. You have got to be kidding me. How can this happen again? Match point just like last time. They get three opening kills just like on Chalet. Deadshot finds two, P4 finds the third. Okay, it's a done deal. Wait a second. They don't check their flanks again. If this ends up at Wolves going to overtime and losing out this best of three series, that's gotta be the biggest heartbreak of their careers because they've basically already won this series twice only to throw it away by not having anybody watch the flank, no one setting up the drones, and not really doing the very basic fundamentals of what you should do when you're up in a five versus two. Look, they're sprinting in construct. What are you sprinting for? You're not in a hurry. They have time. 
You know, I often ask myself that question. Why are you sprinting? But, Wolves just, they, they get so close. Yeah. You've got to buffer one more round before overtime is required between these teams. W7M, 10 seconds to insert. what could be the final round for them in this matchup? will be hinged Five upon a defense downstairs. Insertion. It'll be a church defense. Attackers are moving Line up for Wolves, looking attack. very similar to what we saw the first time around. They've yeah. got nuisance ops, you got global ops. I love the IQ. The difference is, is that W7M last time I would argue had more gadgets that IQ countered. This time, Mowgli, sitting on a very impressive 13 kills, won't find the same value from that IQ sensor, but the Commando is pound for pound, the best gun on attack right now. That's why you see so much Grim, that's why you see so much IQ. In addition to them both having strong gadgets, they bring good guns too. And then IQ has nades back, albeit not as effective <laughs> as they used to be when she did. So all in all, a very effective operator, even if W7 have made some wise choices that will render part of this gadget useless. What happened on Chile? When Wolves lost the round that they just did here, is they started slowing down, not playing as confident, not playing as chaotic, and not maybe believing as much in the strategy at hand. And when they lost that previous round, P4, who's calling a lot of shots here in the player cams, he was like smiling in disbelief and like, we did it, boys, but not quite. We gotta do it one more time. Believe in me, believe in our system. We know we can get there. But this has been a very lackluster round so far. Opening hatches very safely. They shot the oh, first couple no, pellets, no, impact no. goes south, but Casey takes a lot of damage from the fire there. He's gonna stay up though. It's not a big deal, but time might become a problem here for Wolves. That Goyo canister just took away half of KZ's life and a third of JV92's. This hasn't really been that scrappy of a match. Usually the kills happen. There's not chip damage that's done like we've seen in other games so far. But the fact that KZ and JV92 are already walking wounded is a worrying sign, especially given the fact that you're going to take some possible side damage from a skeleton key from above, from a Rotero drone going off. So you have to be mindful of that. Final minute, Goyo Canister is still being shot away at as smoke now lingers at the bottom of main stairs. That toxic gas does not greet anybody from Wolves who are largely assembled upstairs in kitchen. This is the biggest challenge of P4 to call the shots here, where to plan how to do it, because if you call the wrong thing, you go to overtime. You call it correctly, you win the series right here, two to one. But they only have 35 seconds. There's a ward on the board, there's a C4, but there are no more smokes. These 30 seconds are true. That's what the attackers have to work with. Bibi doesn't have much information on Nemoto. There's JV92. Damaged, but still able to hold a gun. As now P4 wants to walk in and look for the plan on this angle before, but he's shot away at as KZ gets one on the board. JV92 a second. Herds is there as well. Say goodbye to JV92. As it's Bibu in a 1v3, but Nade sends us to overtime. These two teams cannot shake one another. And there we saw it. The IG yelling from Wolves in panic state, saying, okay, let's just go for the same execute. That's probably the worst thing you can do in this scenario because that's what you did the last time. It's what they're gonna be expecting. It's what they're ready for. You're not gonna drop the kitchen hatch. There's no pressure on the blue side. You haven't breached triple church wall. So it's very predictable for Wolves to go for that kind of plant position. And this is the problem. They become their own biggest obstacle. Imagine your wolves in that round and you just explode on a like five man blue attack, completely surprising your opponent. You sprint in through motor door, trying to breach triple wall maybe or something like that. You change things up like we've seen them do so many times throughout this series. But what do they do? They default back to the safe, easy option, and they hold F, hoping that your teammates get the kills, the enemy whiffs all their shots, or they don't know what's going on. But when things happen in professional play, where people, they watch it, you know, top-down view like we are right now, going, how does X team not know that the enemy team is doing this? Well, it's because when you create chaos in the server by remaining. applying all this phantom pressure, opening hatches, opening walls, throwing down flashbangs, you don't have the overview as a defender as to what the plan position is gonna be. And in that previous round, Wolves did nothing to stress out their opponent. So it's very simple for them to problem solve it because they could see the full picture. So many opportunities that Wolves have let slip away. And I imagine they'll be kicking themselves 
Even in victory, I think Wolves will be unhappy with what they did. I speak with Lilou yeah. quite a lot after these matches, and she is never content. Even when they win, and win convincingly as they have before, she will turn around and say, yes, we made mistakes, we can do better. And I think that's the right attitude to yeah. take. I know W7M takes that approach as well. No team that competes at this top Reloading. level, Nick, is going to be content with winning, no. even if they win. No, no. But if you win poorly, you still got things to work on. You can always be better. Both of these teams have played phenomenal siege so far today. And might I be so brash to say, I think this has been the best, best of three we've had so far at SI. Granted, I have not been able to sit down and watch in the moment every single match, but I have watched most of them and I've gone back and looked at the scores. Because clearly, we just don't have, I don't have the time to do that, but I'm still <laughs> casting, I know you don't. It's I, working. <laughs> we're, we're working boys, what can we say? And of course, we don't have that Jack Fresh Allen work ethic that we talked about. <laughs> but this has been a stellar matchup, and the teams have bucked this defensive trend that we see. They are bringing different tools. They are bringing different operators. In this case, maybe not Wolves. They like their lineup an awful lot. They're not making a lot of changes. Mowgli, though, is off of the IQ. Yeah. On to additional Heart Breach. I do like that small change for Wolves. I do as well. And more importantly, I want to see a change up here in strategical approach from the attack inside. You cannot go for Broke three times in a row with the same exact execute. So I like the switch up with Mowgli, getting more Heart Breach. Could be showing us maybe that they want to try and breach that tri triple wall. Maybe they want to go for third because that's why you'd want more heart reach and capabilities. But right now, they're still in that second phase of the round, setting up, figuring out where are the weaknesses, where can we attack from. Two blue hats, two kitchen, but also down main stairs. KZ ties the record, by the way, looking to break it. As Mowgli dies, but Wolves get a couple kills on the board. Fellow Fox is there, and there's your record holder. KZ smashing the major record. The rest of his teammates, though, of Nade and Fellow Fox will have to hold this together because victory is still within sight on this round for W7M. P4 will fire away and will now stand over toward oh. Blue, but he gets out dueled by Fellow Fox. Shinka sitting on top of the case will have all this work to do on his own, but I don't like this position whatsoever. There's discomfort in the way that he's holding. He walks right into the gas, gives himself away. The audio cue is there. When Shinka gets one, all he needs is a single bullet to hit Nade, and he gives Wolves the round. Series point for Wolves again. Shinka. The anger player on defense plays the smoke. He's been in these clutch positions so many times on the other side on defense, but he finds himself in what looked like a very uncomfortable placement in that one versus two. But I said it, I want to see Wolves explode in the bomb side and not give their opponent the overview. Look at this, Mokka sprints down main stairs. That's like, what are they doing? They're trolling. But that was just the bait. They drop down the kitchen hatch, they drop down the blue hatch, bomb goes down, they get the picks, and while Dobby's and them, they trade it out in favorable numbers, the post plan favors always the attack. 50 kills for KZ through these three maps, and he has broken that record as we said previously, but it might be a Pyrrhic victory for him because there are three and a half minutes separating what could be you from a win or a loss. W7M need the next two rounds. There are only two rounds remaining in this matchup. Just ahead of them, if we're talking records, Citizen holds the best of three record with 55 kills. KZ's at 50. If he can pull off five kills in this round and then the next, it's possible that W7M can win their matchup while still watching history unfold in front of our eyes and KZ can take yet another record home. But all things considered, the fact that KZ has been able to do this over these three maps, and with how quiet he's been on Clubhouse, yeah. makes it all the more impressive. Hats off to him, a huge congratulations. It's always nice to see records fall. As they say, records were meant to be broken. And here we are, Wolves, sitting on map point, series point, yet again. But they have bottled it every time they found themselves on this position on Chalet and Clubhouse. They have to be so much better than they've been rush. previously. They're gonna match the here. Aggression on down up his hatch into a breach. The scabby, the people, he stops the breach. He stopped the rush right now. It's not gonna happen. They're gonna peel off instead. But that did cost them a token be call, some flashbangs, but they're still waiting. They've not popped the hatch. Both nades as well, by the way, from KZ. They were lobbed in to try and stop the bandit trip from happening on Jacuzzi. Shinka sees the Lodgy hatch go, and he immediately moves back. 
Now as a maestro, he's very uniquely situated to take multiple targets. But if Shinka dies, you give up a very crucial part of this map, and a team like W7M can feast on that. It certainly looked like they were gonna full commit there. Nate thankfully said, hey, stop. The wall did not get opened up. If you drop the officers now, you will be as good as dead, and we do not want that. So good discipline there on the trigger, not saying go just yet, but ensuring that everybody is ready and in the right positions. Shinka people taking some damage, but for a good course in this round, Main staircase, Baba are broken up. It's Hurts advancing, looking at opening, but Mokti likewise on the roam, trying to figure out where is the attack coming from. Trying to bait him in by shooting through that barricade, maybe gaining the attention of somebody from W7M. Down goes Bellapox. Hurts falls not far after. Shink is still in this position. Bibu dies to JV92. KZ blown up by a Nitro cell. All it takes is Nade to die. He has to fight his way out of this position, but he won't get it done. Deadshot securing the final kill, and Wolves will move forward, knocking W7M down. What a match, Nick. Unpredictable, and every single player we can talk of. That shot while he had a weak chalet, for example, really showed up here in map number three. Valley Box was quiet here in Clubhouse, but a monstrous chalet. All ten players were present. Kill records broken. A lot of things to take away from this series. So much to discuss, and what a battle that was. It didn't just feel like a regular best of three. No. <laughs> that felt like a fight for the finals. Now, a rematch is, of course, always possible. There's so many more games to be played, and I'm sure throughout the rest of this tournament, there will be some matches that live up to this billing, but good God almighty, that was one hell of a game. Yeah, and I think if you're Wolves, the biggest thing to take away here is that you don't feel cursed. You've been so close so many times, and the way Chalet played out, if you didn't watch it, you gotta go back. Had they lost this, they would have said to themselves, we just gotta be cursed. There's no other way around it. I mean, you're on attack. The defenders are still supposed to be stronger than you. Sure. I don't know how much finger pointing we can do at Wolves for this end result, but truth be told, both of these teams genuinely deserve to move forward. They both will, neither go home. But today, Wolves were just a little bit better. And when you're at this level, that little bit makes a whole lot of difference. The desk is ready to break down one of the best matches we've seen in a long time. Take it away, lads. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. We are back here on the desk, and what a game it was. A banger of a game, a barn burner of a game. Mowgli is joining us here. He'll be taking a breath just for the next couple of seconds here before <laughs> we can start having a chat. Congratulations to Wolves. Thank you very much. Probably the best game we've had so far in the tournament. So, Mowgli, first of all, how are you feeling? You're looking First of all, Alhamdulillah. 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 That was the best game. Like, I don't know. We saw so many rounds. We should uh, close uh, Chalet. The 2v5, oh la la, we saw so hard. But it was... Wow, I never played a game like this. It was insane. <laughs> W7M are the best team and we beat them. I don't know why. I don't know how I mean. And I'm so proud of my teammates. They all play well. <sighs> I feel like I played uh, football. <laughs> it's like the World Championship <laughs> final. I need my I'm physically sweating, yeah. <laughs> Jack, you got any questions? So, shall I? Didn't go too well. Obviously, you, yeah. you ended up losing. What did you guys talk about to come back for Clubhouse? Because that must have been, like, horrible after losing Chalet, knowing that you should have yeah, won it. After Chalet, I was really, really upset. Like, we saw the round, the 5v2 at the 6-3 or 6-4. I was so mad. So, I, I, I was really, really upset. But we go on club, like... Uh, it's a new map, it's a new BO, and we go. We we, co we begin in defense, so let's put a max defense, go in attack, let's be like uh, Wolves, you know, like pa, 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 pa. Every time we push tight, every time we are like, you know, surprising and stuff like that. And I'm so proud of my teammates. Did you go in to, de to today with a specific plan on the attacks? So you're talking about them, about how fast they were. With Was the meta, yeah. yeah. With the meta, we, sh we said, Hey, let's play TV. Let's just go. We follow the rounds, three guys pushing. That's it. We just push like a pack, like a one pack, you know? <laughs> Very, that, you should use that a hashtag. I think that'd be pretty good. <laughs> but I've, uh, so my question to you is, it seemed like 
today and this game more than ever, your communication between one another was at its best. We could hear you talking to one another constantly, mm. giving call outs, everything. Like, how did you prepare to get to this? Because it felt like in the past when you played, especially in big games like this, comms would just go down very quickly. Yeah, the comms and the. Uh, the like we, we weren't surprising you know like we were playing uh, very slow they they know how we play so we just said go push 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 and it worked i mean you just get kept everybody constantly kind of hyped up for it but yeah. there were times where especially like this the second to last round you won the round and then immediately celebrate but stop yeah, stop. yeah, yeah. we still have one we more have relax one. yeah get into it so that's I feel like you've all matured as a team. Yeah, because all team are, we like the energy, you know, belly goal in Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. We love to bring energy together, so. But 7-6, we have to put this on and we managed it, so. What would you change for the next games? Nothing. Honestly, not even not how, look, I'm sorry to say this, but I, I will <laughs> quote I will quote someone who, who responded to a, to a tweet about it. It seemed like with the 2-5-2 two, two losses that yeah. you had, that you're taking strats out of the m and Strat book. And what? Did you they, they lost five twos. Ah, five okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Twice. <laughs> okay, so. but yeah, but like the first 5v2, we just throw it like uh, we didn't react at the, the information. We know yep. one is uh, blue stairs, one in games, go push. But only me and Bibu pushed, so we fell down. And the second one, oh, we all like we all understand what happened, but we said one below, one side, go push, side, go push, side. But the guy below just took two kills and. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mowgli, I think it's time for us to close it off. Yeah. Anything you would like to say to all the fans and French fans, you got Cam right here on the red, okay. on Cam 4. Well, thank you very much, everyone who support us. Thank you, Wolves, of course. They're all, they're, they're all best, like, really. I, I hope um, we manage to, to play like this every, every match, and Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mowgli. Congratulations on the win. Jack, I think we can nail it. And if you can give the, the seal of approval yourself, the best game we've had so far at SI. The best game by far that we've had at SI. Two of the highest quality teams. And that seems like a mad surprise considering that, you know, Wolves were involved in the general sentiment around this team going into the tournament. Such high quality from both of them. Jeopardy in all of the rounds, you know, the, the 5v2s we fought, they'd messed it up even in the very final map. Like, wow, what a series. Does it even impress the God Emperor himself? I mean, yes, that game is the best one we've seen so far this entire tournament. And it's gonna take a lot to live up to this one if we're gonna see one just as good as it. But even though Wolves were successful in this, we saw two overtimes. We saw a very yep. close match between the two. W7M, even Mowgli himself said, they are the best team in the world, and yet we're still able to beat them. W7M gave it their all, and I'm sure they are not done even though they go down to the lower bracket. You've had that fight before, Fabian. I've had that fight, and now you know your back is against the wall, so there's nothing you really have to lose except, well, going out of the tournament. So you give it all, every single game, every single map, and you just prepare like there's no tomorrow. But G2 last year did pick Wolves yeah. in, the, in the, the second place teams, picking the third place teams. G2 picked Wolves, lost in the upper bracket, sent to lower bracket and won the thing. W7M have done the same, same thing. They picked Wolves, they lost, now they're now in the lower bracket. JB did tell us Can, they wanted JB to go JB did the, say yeah. they wanted to follow in the footsteps of G2. It They've made a great first start. So what we're saying is both Wolves and W7M achieved their goals with this game. Yes. Which is one is to win and move forward, and the other is to lose and then move forward. Yes. It just makes for a better story, let's be honest. It, it does make for a better story. I do think the Wolves could have been here a little bit earlier, though. They should have Absolutely. ended this yes. game on the five versus two that they had on Chalet, and then they and another five versus two eight. So <laughs> they should have ended it a lot earlier. There's an argument to say, especially at this point, that they will take the result over the performance any day. Yeah, and I think absolutely. the performance was great. Sure, they shouldn't maybe have gone to a map three, but they got the job done, they got the result. They will take so much out of the fact that they've beaten W7M. Just the mentos from this. Like, yes. imagine. And they know that- Who they are they gonna be scared of going forward? They know that they should have won this much earlier. So there's nothing that they're gonna fear now because the hard part, well, they've proven they can do that and they can manage to recover when they're down. It's going to be amazing. A land kill record busted and yet still not a victory. But I want to turn to you, Jack, because you have round 10 to talk about. Yeah, so we've got a clip from Wolves and I thought this was absolutely, you know, great play from Wolves. And I think it's 
particularly Shinkron's the Blitz. Now, the, the Breach is going off on the CC wall, and the Sophia Stunts has gone through to top red, hence why those two players are stacked to top red. This is the genius bit. Flash them, make them aware of your presence, make them panic, but get the site control because you've got the site control. Previously, we've seen Bibu rush a bit too far on the Blitz on Chalet and die because of it. This time, Shinka kept the cool, made the panic on W7M's side and got the plant down. I thought that was incredible. And this is kind of the things that Wolves have been known for. And I said, I actually said in the pre-match, I was a bit worried about them on their attacks. Could they emulate some of this style of attacks on Clubhouse? I wasn't so sure, but they did. They managed to get the plant down on a very, very unexpected and, you know, pre-planned attack, as we said, because it was happening as the breach was going off and they win the round. It's just, it's a huge thing that Wolves have the ability to do. All of this is super impressive if you're a Wolves fan. However, if you're a W7M fan, I think you might feel a bit of underwhelming feeling because I think that when you've played against Wolves this much and you know how they're going to attack, and you don't adapt for the third map? What's yeah. up with that? You're W7M, two-time major champion in a row, and you cannot adapt in the middle of a game. I mean, your staff should have helped you. Maybe your in-game leader should have helped you. But someone needs to realize Wolves are doing a specific gameplay, which is very, very aggressive rushes, and you guys just don't do react to it. I'll tell you one thing. P4 was incredible in his calls. I, I understand you the understand language. French, yeah. I understand so the language and his body language, especially when he's able to cool down the team and then give the proper callouts, timing everything. You can hear them preparing it all. And this is something it's like I've never seen Wolves playing this way. And it's like they've stolen that thunder off of W7M and planted it in themselves. And that is despite the actions of one player on W7M. KZ, who he said has broken the LAN yeah. record for best of threes, 50 kills. That is one kill more than Nesk, Nef. if I'm not mistaken. Yes. One kill more than Nesk. He has the LAN best of three kill record. Really, actually, you know, he, he saw down in the third map. He only had a one KPR. And I was just only. like, wow. Um, yeah, no, this guy was incredible. I feel like we've said it after every single map when we've showed him, but yeah kill record and still being on the losing team. I think Parker actually mentioned it in the cast. He's like, would you offer him a kill record or would you offer him the win? He takes the win every day. So, you know, breaking a kill record and being on the losing team, it must hurt. I mean, you will go up to the practice room and you'll have a sour feeling in your mouth. That's just the way that it will be. You cannot go and have a kill record and lose the game and then feel happy. Yeah. It just doesn't exist. Now, let's take a look at our Intel play of the game. We'll put it up on screen for you. Uh, there's been so many great games in this matchup and so many great plays. What do you think about this one, Jack? Yeah, I think this was, this was a huge retake, and particularly from KZ. Obviously, we did just speak about the kill record, but the impact he had and the facts on Oregon, they took it so close because Wolves realistically should have had a 4-2 split, but KZ managed to find the ace. Um, the plant spot from Wolves, I don't think was great and gave the opportunity to KZ, but his movement, if you look at where he took those engagements, he was taking engagements all around the bomb site. It wasn't static and he was forcing that retake for his team. I mean, with the positions Wolves had, that round should have been over. Yeah. And then one man decides, that's not the case. Not today. There's nobody on, on Big Window to try to hold that retake. There's nobody also to shut off the cross where we saw him lying down first and getting the first kill as the lesion. It was impeccably played, and that's just the one player. And even though you've only seen KZ here, you could pretty much find replays for every single player of both of these squads during this series. When we say this has been the best series so far at SI, we definitely mean it. So for those that are just tuning in, Make sure you come back and watch this once this entire day is done. I'm sure you'll learn something from the best players out there. Here's a recap, though, of our bracket with our first two games being complete. Both two ones, FaZe having defeated the Loss, and they will move on to play G2. With Wolves also defeating W7M, they will play Sonics on the other side, which I'm actually very excited for. Big fan of the Sonics and what they've been doing so far. Though, down in the lower bracket, W7M and Loss are not done yet. Fear X, our Korean squad, goes up against W7M, and then Bleed, who have surprised everybody th through this tournament so far, they'll go up against Loss. But in that lower bracket, if you snooze, you lose, and you are out of the tournament. No second chances unless you are still at the top. I think that's pretty fair, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, we saw a team win it from low bracket last year. There's no reason these low bracket teams can't do it again, but it is one hell of a miracle run needed. You just play so much, though. So you get into a flow state where you just keep pushing through games. So you'll be comfortable in the lower bracket as soon as you get that momentum. And again, don't you think you would rather go into lower bracket this early? Because then you can just keep on winning. Some team that will go down further on, they will have come down into the lower bracket from a loss and feel kind of... Well, we're about to go out now. Maybe things are 
looking a bit poorly. Well, Fresh, Fabian, it's been a pleasure going through game number one of the day. Yeah, by the way, this is game number one. We still have uh, more to go through, four in total on this stream. So, in the meantime, before we go into Dark Zero versus Liquid, we have the Beastry, games that, Beastry game that is going on at the same time. That is Fury versus NIP. So, I'll put that up on the screen for you, and we'll, we'll be back. We'll be talking about our second match, Dark Zero versus Liquid. Don't go anywhere! More Siege coming live from Sao Paulo. <laughs> 